Hello, Mike. It still says Michael Molnar is connecting to audio. And Michael Molnar looks like a target from the uh, police uh, pistol range right now. I see no picture. Mike, if you can hear me, I'm hoping to try to get you in here before I open it up so that we can test your uh, share screen, but that is not exactly rocket science. So if we have to figure it out during the meeting, we can do that too. But it looks like you're having trouble logging in. There you are, but your microphone is turned off. You are muted. Right now, how's that? There you are, that's better. So I think you're in Mexico. I am, and I'm just living it up, so I figured I'd go for the full effect here. That's it. <laughs> you need a sombrero. Is that Although, well, well, you need something. Let me tell you something. I'm the, uh, I'm the whitest guy here, so I always draw attention to myself. But if you don't wear a hat, you fry immediately. I would have, yeah. uh, I wouldn't even have skin cancer. I'd just be dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. How long have you been down uh, there? Uh, just that we just got here a day before yesterday. Oh, okay. And we're gonna be down here for a month and a half this time, so that's gonna be oh, interesting. Wow. What yeah. time zone are are you in? Is that Eastern or Western? Uh, I'm two hours uh, uh, behind you guys, uh, so it's. Uh, what is it? Like it's 552, 552 right now. Here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you call, I just found out the other day, Mexico decided to not to do uh, daylight savings time anymore. Yeah, except, I think... for, except for a handful of cities right along the border with the United States that, that are heavily dependent on U.S. economy. Now, what could possibly go wrong with that? Yes. It's going to be time zones all over. It's going to be like Newfoundland time, you know? Uh, well, there's Indiana. It splits uh, right down uh, the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway. So you want to try your share screen just to know that it works? Uh, yes, sir. Let's see. Just kick it on and kick it off. And, uh, you know, you you know where your stuff is. You'll need to, you know, preload it. So it's up there, of course. But just make sure. Yeah, there you go. Okay. okay, life is good. Yep. Then I will. Uh, now, now I know how to, how to get out of this. Then. Uh, well, for, you just got to shut it off, or I can shut it off. Uh, if no, you, I got uh, it. I found it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. It's All only right, going to be good. five, five or ten minutes. It's about the um, stuff I, I loaned to the IEEE for their uh, traveling museum. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be absolutely fascinating. Well, you know, uh, were you on last month's meeting? Yeah, you were. Uh, not in the beginning. I came in oh, okay. uh, about about forty minutes in. 
that was so spectacularly well received that we, uh, partly because um, uh, the guys, Bobby Anderson mostly, realized that he didn't hardly scratch the surface. And, yeah. uh, and, and the, the reaction that I was getting back from people was, you know, the people really, really enjoyed that meeting. So we said, well, let's do a part two or maybe a part three or a part four, too. So, um, yeah, take as much time as, as, you know, seems appropriate tonight, because if we don't cover everything that these other guys need to cover, uh, we're just going to have another meeting on the same subject okay. uh, until we run out of gas. But it's uh, it was, uh, you know, there was a lot there to cover. And uh, and people seem to really, uh, you know, they seem to really enjoy it. And by the way, you're per, uh, we don't I don't have you on the panel, but you know, you certainly know uh, as much or more about this stuff as anybody yeah, else. But, you know, I, I, I do in. have a little a story that I I think I'll uh, yeah. contribute today. That um, it's actually um, I'll have to kind of cage it so that the names will be <laughs> will be changed to protect the innocent. Yes, we always have but, to do uh, a little of that. Uh, but I'm I uh, do a I'm going to do a presentation on the closing days of the David Sarnoff Library sometime, but I don't think I can change that name, and and I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble with all the yeah. stories that I have to tell because yeah. it was a shit show. <laughs> well, mine, uh, you know, I, I was actually asked to be a, an expert witness when a a um, restoration job went south and a and a, and a lawsuit in, uh, ensued. Ooh, and that um, wasn't a Chuck Azar thing, was it? Okay, so I, I'm going to have a hard time changing the names to protect the innocent. Yeah, but oh. uh, without without naming him, uh, I can tell a little bit about how the story went. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, be careful, because I started telling... What did I start doing? Uh, I, oh, I started telling a story about uh, Pete Graves uh, on, on Facebook the other day. I don't know if you knew Pete. Uh, no. But he was a b big collector out in Pennsylvania. And I started telling some... There was a seamy side to the story, so I left that. I didn't put in any personally identifying information, mm -hmm. and um, more than a couple of people knew who I was talking about, so I had to take it all down and and, yeah. st and shut up. So I was like, because I didn't want anybody to look bad, you know, and, and right. it would have made it would have made him look bad. Uh, so I said, well, uh, didn't get away with that one, did I? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, but there's just things that were typical in that story that. Uh... But yeah, I, think I know all the I know all the players in that story. I'm sure I know what you're going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> um, surprise me. Maybe I don't. But uh, no, I think just I do. the uh, I, I think the point I want to make is that um, you know the the price he put on doing that job that that he told me was ten thousand dollars. Yeah, and and, which, and, and, and which, my point is going to be a whole basically bunch of, whole bunch of TVs. That was not for one TV. Uh, he he was going to restore some simpler ones, but that that restaurant or bar kind of TV was the main item in it. And and my point is just that um, you know a lot of high end salesmen, if you ask them what something is worth, their answer is usually what somebody will pay for it. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's if everybody agrees, that's fair. I and, thought that that was an insane price, but I had nothing against it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, and basically, if you know, if, if you're going to get involved in some kind of deal like that, to basically spell everything on, out. Mike, hold on, hold on. I have an I have an alarm going on here. I have to shut off. Okay. Uh, I think it was to wake me up to come to the meeting. I don't know. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, you know, just right. basically. I got to I got to turn on the the meeting. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I got to turn on the it. meeting. So uh, oh. go into. Yeah. Save it for the thing. Okay. Here we go. Dave, you got to mount that camera higher or cut your nose hairs. I'm uh, I'm busy trying to deal with all the uh, uh, administrative nonsense on the control panel here. I have a comfortable chair, which I'm going to sit back in in just a second. But otherwise, you get to see my dentures um, or whatever. 
<laughs> okay, I think uh, we got uh, all the nonsense taken care of, and uh, I'm going to go get a beer now. Okay. It's a nice background. Looks like you're still in Mexico. Looks real. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm hoping to get the DX award tonight. I'm. Uh, if if I leave the meeting early, it's not because I didn't like what uh, what you guys were talking about. It's because I'm on a weaselly DSL connection out in the mountains in central Mexico, and I was on a Zoom meeting last night, and it cut out on me like eleven times. So I may or may not be here for long. <laughs> well, now you know what I was putting up with last month. <laughs> no power. Yeah, well, no, I don't. I'm not running my uh, my iPad on kerosene, at least. So <laughs> I had the Coleman lanterns burning in the house. So uh... <laughs> I believe you, Dan. I believe you had the only Coleman lantern lit Zoom uh, attendance in history. I, I'm I'm pretty sure you can claim that. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that, but you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, I have a I have a stunt double meeting host ready to jump in. Hello, Richard. Has the uh, Sonola cartels uh, gotten to your internet yet? Because I know you're paying uh, them for it. I told you if if the cartel comes after me, uh, I'm just going to reach out to the community and threaten to bury them in television sets, and they will back off quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Probably right. Yeah, 1B3s. Actually, we could bury them in 1B3s. Nobody would want that. Uh, that would be a terrible thing. Everybody was asking for you at the Hanfest swap meet today. Yeah, I missed my opportunity to buy more crap and uh, put it in my storage unit. So uh, oh. apparently that was a win for me. That was a good show. Good show. Yeah, I imagine. Next one. Next one. Did you get over to the annex to uh, John Garrison's uh, house sale? I I didn't. He had a um, he had flyers to give out, and yeah. he had a big spread of uh, good stuff on his tables. And yeah. I got him up on the microphone to uh, talk it up uh, at the end yeah. of the show. Ah, and, okay. he, and he had a well, following. You... He had a following uh, going over to his house. Yeah. Well, you saw it. You, you were here on this meeting when John had the uh, tour of his house, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've, where, I've seen John's, I've seen John's house, but, but but I've also seen his B stock. I've seen his crap, and his crap is better than my A stock. So yeah, that was uh, well, that he was. Must uh, have had his uh, B stock with him uh, on the table. So uh, okay, he sold where, that. Uh, where was the ham swap? Parsippany, PAL, Parsippany, New Jersey. Ah. Worth I'm the trip hoping, from anywhere. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get to uh, the Dayton Ham Fest this year. I'm planning on it. Well, I got to tell you, as much as I have, uh, you know, local uh, hometown pride in the New Jersey Antique Radio Club's uh, swap meet at Parsippany, uh, Kutztown is coming up, and Kutztown just blows everything else out of the water. So wherever you are in the country, it's worth the trip to Kutztown. Has anybody been to Dayton since they've been at the new location? Yeah, I've been there twice. It's a uh, the food is tremendously good, and by the way, it's the largest ham convention in the world. So we was I was there for one day, and we couldn't even hope to finish covering the outside. Uh, it was <laughs> unfathomable, unfathomable. Yeah, I'll try to keep my wallet in my pocket. They said Orlando, Florida was a pretty good sized one down there that was uh, a match for almost Dayton, such as it is. Yeah, I, uh, I saw some video streams of that and it was pretty big. Uh oh, I better uh, put my radio voice on. Yeah, you got to watch what you say now. <clears throat> the, uh, well, I guess it's. Uh, it's time to start soon-ish. Is Steve on? And now the start of our show now. Yeah, Steve, we can't hear you. There's Steve. There's Hi, Steve. Steve. Hi, Steve. Yes. Yeah, it's okay, okay now. Yeah, I was bearded. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we got uh, what do we got? It says 45 people on, so maybe, maybe we can wait another couple minutes. I, uh, I I expect we'll probably get a few more, so we can. Uh, why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we wait, wait two or three more minutes? Yeah. Yeah. We can keep the book club going in the meantime. <laughs> David Karlstrom, hi. Hello, David Sika. I haven't been to any of your audio of club meetings, although I keep hoping to get to one because it, they just sound spectacular. And thank you for the uh, for the uh, link that you sent me. But uh, damn, it's a uh, schedule conflicts shouldn't be that regular and, and that uh, that bad. But uh, one of these days. I, I have to assume that the audio guys are at least as crazy as the TV guys. Uh, there'd be a, a fair match there, yes. Okay. Are are your are your audio guys? You're you're not the oxygen free cable audio guys, though, are you? No, we we uh, uh, believe in science. Okay, good. Just checking, just checking, because there's a lot of there's a lot of different facets, there's a lot of different branches of the family out there. Maybe he's with the uh, cryogenic uh, sector. Well, yeah, I, 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 really like the people, I really like the people who put their speaker wires up on little trestles. It looks like a Lionel train set from the 70s or something. Hey, it looks good. Uh, I hate, it must be hell to vacuum clean around it, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got you to just kind of put them up high enough so that the Roomba goes underneath of them, you know? Science well, maybe that, maybe us, that works. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, David, yeah. Uh, David, are you, a, David, are you a member of the Audio Engineering Society? I am. We have a convention coming up in uh, New York. Indeed. I'm, uh, I'm the co-chair of the Historical Committee of the AES. And we'll have a few good events in New York. I've been going to the virtual meetings in uh, various corners of the world, like Australia and Pacific Northwest. Yeah, Pacific Northwest is a very active section. Whoever mentioned Lionel Trade, thanks for the reminder of what I need to buy. I found out I'm going to be a grandfather come uh, September. Hey, hey, Grandpa, I just met somebody else today who's into uh, TV DXing. How do you like that? Yeah. There's, there's at least two of you. Hey, Dave, I think that was probably the best reasoning for why to have those cable trestles is so your Roomba can get underneath them. <laughs> I'm thinking of putting my furniture, some, my, whatever furniture I have that's too low to the ground, I got to put it up on blocks now because... Uh, Man, I I got to do nothing. Oh, hey, go uh, go do your job, and I'll sit here and have a beer. <laughs> science science is wonderful. I'm telling you. There's more there's more computing power in that damn vacuum cleaner than there was in the Apollo uh, space uh, space module. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting living in the future. That's all I can say. Um, before we actually start, could so I can't. Uh, I'm on a iPad out here. Uh, could somebody just jump onto YouTube real quick and, and make sure we're going out on YouTube? I got some complaints that uh, that, that wasn't always happening. Anybody got a second screen handy? Speaking of ham fest, did anybody go to the Severeville ham fest today? Don de esta uh, Amphest? Uh, yeah, they have the one at the fairgrounds. YouTube's the running. It's yeah, the feed looks good, but it is good, Dave. Good. I thought it was, but, uh, you know, again, I got some complaints, so I wanted to make sure. Okay, we're ready to get started. Let's do it. All right. Welcome, everybody, um, to our March meeting. Um, Apologize for the late um, notice to everybody. We got we got two of them out, but normally, but the first one wasn't was just this Wednesday, so it just took that long to get things set up. 
but it looks like most people got the message because we got we're up to what 47, 48 people here, and plus whatever is on on YouTube. So welcome everybody. Um, we have a nice program tonight. Um, let's start out um, with Dave giving us courtesy um, announcement. Yeah, we've all gotten pretty good at this. Just uh, please keep your microphones muted unless you're uh, actively uh, asking a question or, or, or speaking as a part of the panel. You wouldn't want to have your microphone muted then. But uh, yeah, we haven't had any any catastrophic uh, failures in, uh, in etiquette. So uh, let's uh, just enjoy the meeting. Dave's mic. Steve's mic doesn't seem to be working right. Yeah, I can't tell because my signal keeps flanging out. Uh, Steve, you can hear us. We're not hearing you. Okay. Well, we don't have an understudy for Steve, so. Steve, you're uh, you're not coming through. Um, maybe try uh, try jumping out and coming back in again. Well, Steve, it's nice living in the future, but sometimes the future is a lot like the past. We need to brush up on our lip reading skills. Yeah. And then those Zoom ran on Windows XP. You had a good signal about 720p during the preamble, and uh, about a minute ago you dropped to about 244. So yeah, I see your, your point about your signal instability down there. Yeah. Well, I can always watch the recording on YouTube tomorrow. Nothing's ever easy. Nice background and the hat's a nice touch. Yeah, I figured I'd go all in. Well, that's not a fake background. That's actually where I'm sitting right now. And Makes we are it even better. Yeah, we are Steveless. Hold on. How about now? Uh, yes, you're back. Good, good. Of course, nothing is as easy as it should be. I thought if I just re, re clicked on that same link, I'd get you, but I got the post meeting page. So I had to look it up again. Anyway, I'm here. Um, so, opened up. All right. Um, I want to start by thanking the uh, New Jersey Antique Radio Club for sponsoring this meeting and providing our Zoom feed. It's, uh, it's really very helpful. And um, here's a, a brief report on the museum. Um, nothing much is new other than we're well into the planning for the convention. Um, it's, uh, the registration is open, and we urge you, if you're planning on coming, to, to register as soon as you can. So we got a good idea of uh, how many attendees we're going to have, because we've got to tell the caterers the numbers for lunch and for, uh, for dinner. Just to remind you, I would, it, it's on our home page. There's a link to the museum with information on the, the auction. Uh, swap meet, a, a, a tentative schedule for the museum, and um, a, um, uh, a page about the sweepstakes. We do need some more applicants for presenting papers. Um, we have a couple, but we want to have a, a variety to, to um, choose from. 
So if you're interested in presenting a paper roughly a half an hour, 45 minutes long, um, on really on anything, be technology or history or whatever you want to do, as long as it's related to, to um, television, um, old television preferably, uh, please um, uh, email us and let us know what your topic would be and so forth. And if you know anybody um, that is, um, uh, would you think might want to make a presentation, please contact them. Um, the um, prize for the, uh, for the sweepstakes arrived in um, um, Indianapolis for the cabinet guy to, to restore. Um, there's a link on the, web, on the convention page to, uh, right now all it has on it is the, um, uh, what the set looked like when it arrived there. And you can see he's got a lot of work to do. But he is confident he'll have it done in time for the convention. And uh, Dave Arlen has agreed to make arrangements to get it over here. So it'll be here for the convention, and we'll we start the sweepstakes then. Um, we have about 155 members. We've picked up about five more over, over the last month. And that's sort of typical. It slows down. But as people register for the convention who aren't members, they typically join uh, at that time. So. I expect we'll get to get a bunch more. So any questions about uh, about the museum? Okay, well, let's move on to, um, to Larry. If you can, um, Dave, if you can hook him up. Coming up. There we go. Um, this month, um, I'm going to talk about the Olympic duplicator. This was, was made in 1948. And as nearly as I could tell, it served um, several uh, functions. Um, one of them was it was part of the hotel vision system. And what they had was, uh, was um, six channels. Um, in, in a head end in the in the hotel, each one with a with a receiver, um, with um, video and out, audio outputs, and then um, a cable from um, these du duplicators um, from 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 the head end to the duplicators. And the idea, is, I guess, is you put one in each room. Um, and they're push buttons. You can see on the front of it. Um, well, this is a different version. I'll tell, talk about it in, in a minute. But in the Hotel Vision version, um, there is a there are push buttons there. And when you push the button, a signal was sent back up the cable. They were home run cables um, to uh, connect to, to a switch that would connect the TV set that had the, the channels corresponding to that button. Uh, so it, it's like the first one might be the ABC affiliate and the, the uh, switch would connect it, the, the, the signal from the ABC receiver to the cable that goes to this thing. Um, I would only know of one hotel that installed it. I don't think they got very far with that. But after I um, put this on display, I got information from several other people. Um, for other uses of this. Um, one of them is um, that um, somebody um, sent me a picture of a console TV set that um, for home use uh, in a nice cabinet that has a connector on the back for, um, for one of these duplicators. And I think um, the, the television set had a screen on it, and you, the idea, I guess, was that you could put this in a different room, uh, minus the push buttons. It only has one output. So whatever channel the, the, the TV receiver was tuned to is what you got on the duplicator. 
And then also I've been told that this is it, um, was used often as a sort of nice looking monitor um, in TV stations, you know, something that looks a little nicer than the, than the, um, than the, you know, uh, normal monitors that you find in a, in a TV studio, maybe in the boss's office or something like that. Um, there are similar ones. There's another one made by um, Vidcraft called um, uh, Adavision, which is the same concept, basically. I don't know how many of these were made, if this, if this was common back there. I know I have not seen another one of these sets surviving. And my guess is that it was something that only that didn't go on for very, for very long. So anybody have any questions about this gadget? Why on earth did they do this? This seems like a really hard way to do something that should be pretty simple. Just put a TV and have an antenna distribution system, but maybe they hadn't thought of that then. Was it about money? There were TV standard coax distribution systems in existence. The, the advertising, the reason it was advertised is that because um, you didn't have a, a tuner and IF section, you could sell, sell the duplicator for less than you could sell a, a, um, a TV set for. Uh, that seems sort of silly because the, you know, the head end had to, had to cost a, a substantial amount. Maybe if you had a huge hotel, it would pay. Steve, was this similar in concept to that uh, mysterious device that uh, Steve Goulart uh, brought to the museum? I don't remember that. What, what was it? Uh, it was a. I don't think we. Any, I don't think we really know. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Can Larry, maybe can Larry go over there and show a picture of it? It's over to the left in the uh, middle middle room. Um, in on the first row. Uh, are you talking about the? Um, is it a look? Does it look like a converter of some sort? It's a. It's a. Um, yeah, I, you know what? It's been long enough. I don't know what the hell it looks like. <laughs> Larry, go in the first room, the first row there. And up on the top, um, oh, this row is. Yeah. Straight ahead. Oh, straight ahead. I think. And to the right, I don't know if we're in the right room. Uh, yeah, that thing there, the uh, Dumont demodulator. Uh, well, yeah. Um, again, the only thing I can figure because it's in a nice case, you wouldn't have that in a in a um, uh, you know in a studio or control room. Um, so it's just all of this is a standard demodulator just in a fancy case. Yeah, we don't so know what they use that for. I don't know what it was for, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just wondering. Okay. Um, hey, Larry, while we're on the subject, look, Turk, go to the other side of that room. There you go. Now come, Pat, work your way back. No, the other way. Keep going. Just walk down that way on that side. And stop at the, I think it's this gadget right here. Stop there, yeah. Not that one, one next to it. Um, now this is an interesting gadget. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a um, um, a strange remote control, um, and um, we don't understand what it was used for or how it how it was connected. Um, you can see it's got a tuner and it's got an audio and video level output on it. I mean, the controls on it, um, but um, we don't know what it was used for. Steve, yeah, that uh, is a uh, wired remote control, uh, yeah. one of a, a small class of similar devices in the early 50s uh, before uh, wireless remote controls came along. And uh, that one was sort of an, um, a universal one that uh, would essentially the tuner in there would shift down to a uh, convenient channel and ship it out to uh, your TV set across the room. So you have this thing next to your, your 
easy chair and you'd be able to set the channel, adjust the volume and uh, do some um, picture uh, levels, contrast basically. It all just, you know, it was very dependent on the early TV sets not having much in the way of AGC and uh, playing games with the uh, four and a half megahertz uh, uh, sound frequency to uh, get a volume control. But uh, there were at least, I've got two other similar things like that in my collection uh, that uh, one, the nicest one is the Regency RT700, which is very handsome and uh, did a fancier job. Uh, but there were things made by other outfits as well. I wrote a, an article on Antique Wireless uh, journal uh, about wi wired remote controls. Oh, can you send that to me? I'd like to. Um, I'll put it on the website next to. Oh, the, sure. Next to this gadget. Yep, I'll make a note. Send that. Great. Um, any other questions or comments? Well, if not, then let's go to um, Mike Molnar contacted me earlier today and said that he had a very brief presentation that he would like to make. He said he could do it some other time. We didn't have time, but we're really flexible. So um, um, let's, let's, let's hear from Mike. I, I am here and I'm gonna do share screen and hopefully this is gonna come up. Uh, click it again. Does that do it? Coming up. <laughs> Okay. There we go. This um, this is a display that uh, the IEEE put together. Uh, I happen to be talking to the someone you guys mostly know, Alex Magoon, uh, a few months ago, and I was telling him about a um, artifact that came into my collection of a uh, prototype superhead uh, of Alan Armstrong, um, Howard Armstrong's, and um, when he heard about that he was telling me that the armstrong family had actually uh, given a donation to the ieee to put together a display commemorating uh, armstrong's work and um, he knew about most of the other things in my collection so basically he came over and we put a shopping list together of things that that have gone into what they're calling a, a traveling uh, museum display um, what you see on the screen is the first uh, place they've set it up at a hotel in New York for a uh, IEEE executives uh, meeting. And this is in a common area that they can go during during breaks and things. And from there, it's going to go to some other locations, uh, eventually to a um, they're thinking of a museum that's supposed to be opening up in in San Antonio, Texas. The. Um, interesting piece that i i told him about is actually in this picture this is armstrong with the prototype of the uh, six tube super hit and um this goes back to 1923 and um this is the actual radio that's in the picture that came my way uh sitting on a chair before i took it over to the uh, to the ieee building and um and that's the picture of armstrong with it um, the, let me get my set up here. The, the idea of everything they took for the display was to cover Armstrong's three, uh, major inventions. The, uh, the first was the regenerative circuit or feedback circuit, which, uh, became the center of everything in, the, in the early 1920s. Um, up in the display case in the, in the back, you can see, uh, in the upper part, a uh, DeForest uh, RJ4 with an Audion tube. And that's what Armstrong would have used something like that to experiment with an Audion tube when he was, a, I guess, a teenager yet. And um, when he heard all the squealing that it was making, he did the analysis to figure out that that was feedback. And if he controlled the feedback, he could get a, uh, a large amount of amplification out of a device that didn't do much amplification. And uh, below that is the one of the first uh, regenerative sets that was made for sale to the public, the uh, Westinghouse's uh, uh, model RC. They, they also had the RA and the DA in, in two separate boxes. And then um, 
as he got back into what was the early broadcast period, uh, the set in the front is a Klitson three tube regenerative set. Um, if I had a closer picture, it, it actually puts uh, Armstrong's patent number on the front panel. And this used a, um, in the in the viewing hole, the first tube is, is the regenerative detector. And then there's uh, two, uh, two audio tubes uh, feeding out to the horn speaker in the back. And he also got some, uh, at least a B battery to show with it to give an idea of what people had to go through to power their, they would have had their even bigger A battery, uh, this B battery with uh, probably a 22 and a half and a 45 volt tap, and um, and then a C battery to bias the uh, the audio tubes. So after the, um, we covered things for that first invention, uh, here's the prototype superhead on the on the shelf here. And what's special about this, even though the uh, his superhead invention goes back to like 1918 or so, this was made in 1923, and in that in that time, as RCA came to control the uh, superhead patent, and uh, Sarnoff saw the improved performance in superheads, he decided that uh, broadcasting was booming, and he wanted to be selling superheads and not regenerative sets anymore, and the original design was for eight tubes, which at the time when tubes were so expensive, like a few tubes could add up to a, a week's pay for somebody, uh, he wanted it to be a six tube set. So the RCA engineers were put on the job and um, and as delays were coming after delays, the um, they ended up uh, contracting with Armstrong to solve some of the problems they were having. Uh, among the problems, they they didn't have the tuning range of, of the new uh, allocations for stations. And they had um, image problems where you, you would get the same station in two places as you set the dials. So Armstrong and his, um, his I guess, not protege, but his assistant, uh, Harry Houck, worked on solving these problems. And it was actually Harry Houck that came up with the answer. And that was when they would do the... Um, mixer stage before it would go to the ifs they would normally take the first harmonic and they found out if they took the second harmonic uh at so at the higher frequency separating it uh further from the incoming signal uh, a lot of the problems went away like there might have been still been a, a mirror image but it was outside the tuning range of the radio and they were able to also get the uh, the range that they needed so this is actually called the uh, the second harmonic set and um, Armstrong was uh, uh, known to be very generous with his friends, and um, and his friends were generous with him. Uh, he didn't take uh, credit for this design, um, even though Hauk was working for him. He could have said, well, it's still my patent, but he let, uh, let Hauk patent it. And actually, uh, to, to keep it all in the RCA license scheme, he, um, he paid Hauk $100,000 in 1923 money for uh, for the patent rights and then um we know that this is the actual one um they they made three or harry hauck made three two of them one of them was one was sent to um david sarnoff's home and one was sent to owen young's home he was the chairman of the board of general electric and um those two are a little different than this one that, that hauck kept they had um, room inside for the batteries and uh, uh, a switch in between the two knobs below the meter. And this one doesn't have the switch uh, and neither does the one in the, in the actual picture. The, um, there was also, um, these came from Harry Houck's house after Harry Houck's nephew, who was the last one living there, uh, passed away. And um, and there's if you I don't have any pictures of the inside right now, but you can see where they did puttering around with it uh, after and the and the two that went had gone out to uh, to Sarnoff and Owen Young uh, did come back to Harry and and at the time he had all three at, at the house. So that superhead design is what uh, went into sets like the Radiola 24 that's in the picture here, uh, which was one of the earlier self-contained superhead so you had the loop antenna on the top speaker built in 
uh, room for the batteries. The, if you took the antenna off, it fit in the front cover. And it was all set to, uh, in, as in some of the ads, take it to the beach or into the mountains or on a hike and get your favorite uh, favorite music that way. The uh, the last thing that from his third great invention is the uh, FM wideband FM radio, and uh, they didn't have much room for a bigger set. But this tabletop from uh, Stromberg Carlson um, has the old uh, original FM band uh, from 40 to 50 megahertz, uh, and most of these were thrown out by people because they weren't used for anything after the FCC switched the uh, frequency allotment. But this one uh, still has the uh, the old uh, settings, and uh, Stromberg Carlson was one of the first uh, companies to really believe in FM, and they were an early manufacturer. So that's that's my little presentation. I'm very uh, happy that some of my stuff is going to get some wider exposure. Um, apparently, the uh, members of the Armstrong family that have seen it are very happy with it, and. Um, if I hear of any place coming to a neighborhood like near you, I'll try to let people know. But I, I believe in San Antonio, it should be there for a little longer period with, um, it's part of a new museum that, that they tell me is being built. But I'm uh, I'm happy to have done this with the IEEE and, uh, and I hope a lot of people get to see it. A question to confirm, please. The the picture that you're showing us, this location is in the Columbus location, or is it in San Antonio? Oh no, this this is at a. I, I said it very briefly. It's in a hotel in New York where they were having a a meeting of the uh, IEEE uh, executive boards, and uh, this was in like the common area. I guess after they would come out of individual meetings. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is it still there? Uh, no, I, I believe it's by now it's back to the IEEE headquarters and they, they have a storeroom where they keep a lot of artifacts and then it'll be packed up again. But they use the money from the grant to make the uh, the pull down screens in the back in these uh, uh, professionally made display cases. It costs. Uh, Manhattan, uh, so I was hoping it might still be there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't believe it is. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Mike? Well, Mike, thank you very much. That was uh, that was really interesting. Well, thank um, you. I'm glad to share it. Is uh, is um, Gene Beatty on? Apparently not. He had a question that I don't understand. Um, so. I'll email, he just emailed me a few minutes ago, but um, apparently I assume he was on the meeting, but he's not. Okay. Um, well, then let's move on to our next event. Um, continuation of the panel discussion we had last month. That was awfully popular. We had a large attendance and we've gotten uh, lots of comments. So we figured, well, why not do a second month of it? Same panelists, uh, Chuck Azalina, Bob Anderson, and Dan Jones. So, who's got the dog there? Well, Bob, you had kind of put together a, uh, a kind of a short list of, uh, of some things that uh, you realized we didn't cover the last time. So you wanna, you wanna kick it off? I did, although I was thinking some of those could be broken out as a, a totally separate discussion altogether. Um, well, we can hit the high points today, and uh, maybe we can come back and look at them in detail later. But uh, yeah, sure. Uh, one of them was. Um, well, several of them are more related to actually finding TVs, collecting TVs, knowing what to look for, what's collectible. I see posts all the time on Facebook, on all the on social media, let's just say. What is this? What it's worth? Should I collect it? You know, what should I do with it? What is it? Um, I often point people to the, the museum's website so they can look at photos and try to match up something. And uh, 
it is impressive with some of the folks that have been in this hobby for a while, how they just know stuff instantly. Uh, they can tell you exactly the make, the model, the year, what <laughs> approximate the value, what, what issues to look for. Um, uh, another topic related to that is uh, safety tips. So, so you find a TV and you bring it home, what do you do next? We generally recommend you don't just plug it in and turn it on. Um, no. But what should you do? Uh, I ex- and Bob, I just I just want to point out that there's a, there's a difference between a collector asking that question, obviously, and a, a member of the public. Uh, so that's uh, you, you know we talked yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's something we touched on last week a little bit too. That I got some follow up uh, comments on my YouTube channel about is. Um, should everything be restored? Should everything be fixed? Um, or at what point do you say it's beyond fixing or restoring? Uh, so maybe that's another topic we can discuss as well. So, uh, you know, potential things to love. So I think some obvious things we can agree on is it's good to know if you have a good picture tube or not. <laughs> is it all there? Uh, I just dragged a set home from Gary, Indiana. I thought I got a great deal until I got it home and looked inside and saw that a family of mice had been living in it for some lengthy period of time. <laughs> and I, bl- I had no one to blame but myself because I thought for 35 bucks, I just grabbed it and threw it in the car. I didn't even bother to open up <laughs> the top and look inside of it. So, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, so segueing from that into the safety tips, uh, I'd be curious to hear what the other guys think about just plugging it in and turning it on versus very <laughs> versus starting to recap right away. Before we even get to that, I mean, you talked about, you know, whether is it worth uh, doing anything? I wanted to ask uh, Chuck, um, uh, and Chuck, I assume you're, you're still with us here. I, I, yeah, I don't have any. Yeah. Uh, um, are you ever, do you ever find yourself in a situation where, you know, a, a, a first time collector approaches you and asks you if, uh, if they should buy a set or how to tell whether they should get it or whatever, or is, is that not really where you find yourself in this? I don't find, can you hear me? Okay. I'm not sure if it's working. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, lately, I meaning the last couple of years, most of my requests and most of these come through my website are people just what Bob was saying. They picked up this, re- this television What's it worth? Is the first question out of their mouth. Hmm. Okay, it's nothing about very little has, has it ever been. You know, what? What? Give me a history about what the set is and what's what's nice about it. Any of that? It's just what's it worth. Usually, my canned answer has always been, it's worth less than what it's going to cost you to restore it. If you have no particular interest in the thing, as far as uh, is a family heirloom or something like that. Don't waste your money. Very simple. It's it's not going to work out. Now, the other extreme, I think we went over this before, was I do get a few that say, oh, I've got this set, belong to my grandparents. I want it to work. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, I can see the history in it. And there are a lot of people out there that don't care what it costs either. That's the other interesting thing. I've had I've had some sets in here that cost, uh, God, one in particular was a, a, um, a um, Zenith, or not Zenith, a Dumont, belonged to his grandmother. He remembered it from his, being a kid. Total bill for restoring this little, con- this console done in Chinese decoration. Normally, you nobody here would probably pay more than 150 bucks for it, tops. It was almost $3,000 to restore the cabinet and the electronics. Didn't even bat an eye about it. He didn't really care. He just wanted it done. And uh, But most of these TVs that, that people are bringing in or showing me are the damn little square boxes. You know, 950, you know 1950s through 55s boxes. Ugly as sin. You know, it's like, why do you even want to mess with the set? Well, the uh, let me uh, let me ask uh, Dan to jump in if, if he can on this, uh, but but also you, Chuck. The um, uh, I, I'm seeing 
more instances of people that are that that got found ATV and and it uh, yeah an ugly box uh, you know a, a, a 50s TV that that none of us would pay a dollar for, but they found it. They think it's really cool. Um, more instances of this happening where they want to get it fixed and they don't care what it costs. Um, just because it's more, though, it, I mean, I could probably count on one, you know, the fingers on one hand. But are you guys seeing any trend uh, for that? Because I, I really do think that those ugly uh, $1. fifty TVs are becoming pretty funky looking as enough time has now passed. And yeah, your average you, person is... Until you tell them what it's going to cost. Then yeah. all of a sudden it gets dropped. I've got so many emails sitting here. I was just looking through them. Hey, what do we, what's, uh, I bought this television and brought, I brought it home. It's a, you know, RCA TV. It looks like this. They sent me a picture and it's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw a number at you and I never hear nothing back again. That's the end of the line. Dan, what do you, what, what's your experience then? Uh, I mean, my experience has probably been a little more limited, but, um, you know, I mainly like dealing with the predictors in that, and those are kind of a unique animal in amongst themselves because... Well, let's got, talk about that. Yeah, that's, you've that's got, an interesting topic. Because you've got us TV guys who know that there's plenty of them out there. They're a pain in the butt to work on. Um, they require more work than the average TV to put in a reliable state, at least in my personal opinion. But, you know, there, there's people that really like them. And then you've got the mid-century modern crowd that, you know, they that's like their, their prize centerpiece for their atomic theme living room. And half the time, they don't even care that it doesn't work. Just mm -hmm. they got one and they can put it on display. They may not have any intention of getting it going, but they got one. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think people, you know, if that's the common theme here is that if it's something they really want, money is not going to be an obstacle. They're not going to be deterred by it. It's just, you know, recognizing what has value to them. The old saying, it's only worth what someone's willing to pay. All right. So what, what, um, what can you, what can we realistically do to, uh, you know, Joe Schlobotnik is out there, just found a cool looking TV. Uh, he can't test the picture tube. He can't bring it up on a variac. He doesn't know what the hell people are talking about when you say, "Oh, you got to recap it." What What do you do with somebody who who comes in as a complete newbie and and has this one TV and now might want you to get involved? Throw a rough number to him and then tell him uh, what I've done is bring it over. You know, bring it here or send it if it's small enough. And, that doesn't seem to be a problem either. I've had stuff sent to me that I would never have even thought about sending it through the mail, but you get a people to do it um, and then work it from there. I mean, there's not much you can't, you know, you really can't uh, do any kind of even, uh, even estimate a number or what you can do with it until you actually have it in your hands. There's just, you know, I'm, at least I've never been able to find a way of doing it. Maybe somebody else out there can uh, fix it a sight unseen. Or, or again, you throw a number out and say, yeah, give me a blank check and I'll make it work for you. Can I make a comment here? Um, we get at the museum just tons of requests for value of set. <laughs> and, um, and we usually try to, you know, give people range and... I find people get, a lot of people get really pissed when you tell them that what they thought their 50s box um, is worth 50 bucks um, or 75 tops. Um, and I've had people write back to me and call me a jerk and incompetent and everything else because they wish that, had one woman who wanted to um, have a, Singer portable TV set, and she was convinced that it was made by the Singer Sewing Machine Company, and that somebody there had offered her eight thousand dollars for it. This was one of these cheap plastic, you know, Japanese sets. 
I've got one for her. <laughs> so I, you know, she, he just said, well, certainly you could offer more than that. And I said, well, I suggest you call them and accept their offer immediately. Run after them. <laughs> no. Yeah. Put I it on eBay and whatever these, it sells uh, for. People That's that what make these really broad inquiries are more of the uh, eBay type that uh, are looking for a treat you like an unpaid uh, consultant so they can go, you know, put it at some crazy price on eBay. Yeah, I've seen a lot of those come through where they just want to price um, because they're just going to, they're just trying to find a number to flip it. That's all they're interested in. And those, I didn't, I don't even want to deal with those people. No. Me too. I think most of us don't. <laughs> We have, you know, as you probably know, we have a classified page on the website and somebody calls and said, how can I, or writes and says, how can I sell this thing? And I recommend they put it on the, uh, on our classified pages. And you'll see again, the, you know, the fifties box set, they'll write the ad for it and they'll say $2,000 in great condition. And and I don't say anything, you know, they can do whatever they want, but a lot of them start at $2,000 and keep emailing me every month, uh, lowering the, the price until finally they usually put it in the free item section. You know, one thing that's uh, missing these days, uh, Harry Poster and a few other people had price guide books that uh, one of the best ones it would just like cover a year and only tell you if there was something really valuable in that year that might be worth saving for anybody. But uh, I, I don't, I don't think they've even been reprinted. There's probably a need for some of these eBayers to find a book like that. Now, eBayers don't listen to anybody, anything. Yeah. I, you know, I, I look at a bunch of different, you know, test equipment, phonographs, radios, TVs, and they all have, no matter what you do. And if, and if you try to set them straight, you get what, like Steve just said, they call you every num name in the book because you're just trying to rip them off and buy it cheap. And that's the end of the line. And you, you don't even want to bother with them anymore. I, I did want to say something about your um, uh, discussion before about the price you charged for that uh, Dumont set. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, w with some people, you know what you're getting for for the restoration dollar that you're paying. Uh, I know in discussions with you what you actually do on a set. Uh, other people use that same restored uh, heading for a wide variety of quality of work that they plan to do. And uh, some years ago, I was asked to be an expert witness on a court case for a restoration deal that went south. And um, I, I had time then to give it a lot of thought as to what what I would say to questions that a lawyer would ask me. And um, and in this particular case, um, the person was willing to do the work to what he considered to be restored. I don't know that they ever spelled out all the terms of that, but the price was really high. And the person that was going to be paying the price was uh I guess having second thoughts to what was his uh, dream project. It, it was into the ten thousand dollar range for a, mainly one TV and some minor ones. And in thinking of what I would answer, you know, the the phrase has come up here a little bit that uh, what is something worth? It's it's worth what someone will pay for it. And mm -hmm. if someone really had it in their head that they wanted these sets, they talked to this man who had actually could claim experience on working on those sets when they were still active products that you, you would get a call as a repairman to go out and fix. So he was qualified in that way. Um, so if that person accepted that price, knew the, knew the man and took the explanation, um, you know, my opinion was going to be that he should have followed through and paying the price. Fortunately for me, uh, they settled because they, they would take everybody into the courthouse and they would put all the parties in a room to kind of hash it out before they tied up a judge and, uh, and more lawyer time. And they settled uh, before it all happened and I didn't even get a lunch out of it. But um, anyway, it's that, that idea of, of, you know, be a good um, 
questioner when you want to find out what kind of restoration is going to be done. And then if you have that desire to see that set working, um, and then have to also realize that even some of the best restoration work can go south really quick. I bought a, um, a rear projection set. I think it was a Feta from, um, what was his name? Chuck Azalina. And uh, <laughs> he told me it was fully restored. I bought it from him in Columbus, plugged it in. I haven't gone back to look at it, but the smoke cleared after a little while and, and I just shut it off. But uh, we had a, it's going to happen to the rest of them. We had a fully restored uh, TV in a New Jersey antique radio call. I, I can't hear you. Same, you're uh, you're breaking up. From a guy yeah, you're named uh, you're breaking up. Uh, <laughs> Mike no, Molnar. I and I think there were actual same. flames involved on that one, but you know, stuff happens. <laughs> that happens to the best of them, but uh, I could give a full refund if I did it for free <laughs> and donated the television. <laughs> I had a predictor that I paid way too much money to get restored years ago, and oh, uh, it, worked for, it worked for 30 seconds after I got it home. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I didn't get mad at the guy. I mean, I knew what happened. Uh, you know, shit happens. Uh, but, yeah, I can imagine your unwashed customer would have been pretty pissed off. <laughs> yeah. I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about last month about managing people's expectations. And mm -hmm. that when these sets were new, it wasn't that uncommon to have a guy come to your house four or five times a year to fix something on these. So, you know, you got to remind people that even today, you know, some of the, some of the components in there are old and they're going to let go sooner or later. Yeah. I like to remind people too about, what these sets cost when they were new <laughs> and in modern terms, an easy thing to say is it costs what a car cost. So you can imagine how much TLC you put into keeping your, your, your car running. That's the kind of money and the time and effort people will put to keeping their TV running. Well, let's, let's talk about managing expectations for a second, if we could. Um, and, and also how does somebody who doesn't know anything about this, uh, how do they determine whether it's even worth it for them to send the set to you? Because, you know, they might have a set that's just not, not worth fixing, uh, but they wouldn't know. I've just given them the rough prices that uh, I go back through my invoicing, look at sets that I've done in the past and come up. Right, with but I'm, I'm thinking price. of if it's, it, you know, they, they, they they don't know if it's got a, a, a bad CRT, for example, or, or sometimes they can find somebody locally to help them out. But, you know, I mean, they're not going to go out and get a CRT tester uh, to check this. So they're, they're operating in the dark uh, and, and, you know, potentially really, really disappointed after they pay hundreds of dollars to ship this set to you and you find out, ah, I can't fix it. Well, that's one of the problems that comes mm. with the territory. I mean, that, that's mm. really where, where we sit. He's in the dark and I'm in the dark. Somebody sends me something. I just had a, just to give you, I don't know if I brought this up last time. I just had a woman in Hawaii actually just outright tell me that she wants me to restore this radio phonograph, period. I'm trying to get her to find somebody on the West Coast or Hawaii. She wants nothing to do with it. Mm. Says, I, I want you to do it. So she packs up this thing, ships it from Hawaii to me. I open it up and it's like, holy shit, what did I get myself into? It's a rat's nest inside this thing. Okay, so now what do I do with it? You know, I luckily I didn't give her a price. I, and again, it's a family heirloom, so it makes no difference to her. She just wants it working. But, you know, I'm expecting, as she's telling me, that it's a family piece belonged to her grandfather. I'm expecting a piece that sat in the house. Nice, clean unit, no problems. And when I get it, it's not anywhere near what I'm expecting. So I'm sitting here, putting it together, going to find parts. I'm going to end up finding a whole new radio chassis for this thing because I'm looking at the radio chassis. It's going to be cheaper to go buy another one than it is for me to fix this thing for. Mm -hmm. So it's it works both ways. And I don't know the answer to that either. I mean, it's I, mm -hmm. I can't give them an answer other than the fact that yeah. my, my canned answer, as I told you, was when they call, it's like, uh, it's going to be worth less than what you're going to pay. 
there's a large element of risk to this uh, if, if yeah. they want to get into the game. Yeah. And, and it could be, you know, it could be, a, like you say, it could be a bad picture tube. You don't know. I don't know. And it's just one of those things, unless unless it shows up on your doorstep where you can actually test it and know what it is. But I don't make house calls. Uh, I used to, but not anymore. You know, it's just not worth the aggravation. Well, Bob, let me ask you, I think you deal with a number of people who have some knowledge. Um, what, what do you what do you do to manage expectations with, say, a, a radio guy uh, who doesn't know anything about TVs and, and maybe he's calling on you if, in fact, that that happens? Part of what I, I, I kind of try to feel people out or set their expectation level by saying, what do you realistically, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to sit down and watch this every evening? Uh, Daily Driver, the term people often use. Do you want to impress visitors? Do you want to just have one on, on the shelf queen kind of thing? And so if, if they just have that one TV that they come to me and it doesn't, it doesn't match what their expectations are, I might guide them towards, well, maybe you should be looking for a different set. Maybe this isn't the set for you because it's not going to do that. If you're going to watch it every day, it's not going to last very long. Find a newer TV or one that has a better picture too, or whatever it might be. Or this is this set is a known problematic, cheaply made set. I can do the best I can do, but it, you may get a lot of headaches down the road. So maybe this isn't the right, maybe this isn't the best match for you. Uh, and if you just want it to look cool, maybe it's not worth sinking a lot of money into fixing everything about it and just maybe don't turn it on, just have it for decoration. And go back to like, is everything restorable? Uh, if the chassis is a rust bucket or criti- rust bucket or critical parts are missing, but it looks really cool, it should just be a uh, decoration. Like I got a Bakelite Admiral, that classic 10-inch set, uh, the biggest piece of Bakelite made at the time, came out of a dentist's office and uh, he had partially gutted it. And uh, he said it was, it was just there for decoration. He never... It never even occurred to him that it could be made to work again. <laughs> I ended up buying from him just because of the cabinet was really nice and threw out the insides. And that's another thing, too, is uh, imagine well, these other guys, too, you start accumulating stuff. <laughs> like somebody may drop off something to get restored and give them the bad news, and they just say, oh, we'll just keep it, or do you want to buy it then for parts or something? So I start accumulating stuff that's, Maybe I scavenge spare parts from, but also some of them look kind of nice. So I might say, well, if you just want something for decoration, uh, not to do bait and switch or anything, but maybe I have something that might be more uh, to your tastes. Or I'll give people can I, lead, can lead I throw sets some, too. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, about people's expectations. I, I ran into a problem with, uh, it was actually a restoration I was doing on an early uh, black and white set with a, it was late enough to have a flyback transformer. It wasn't a, a real early uh, set, but um, the expectations the guy had, I went through with him. He was going to trade me a really neat Western electric amp with these tennis ball tubes. And uh, I would do the restoration on this TV. And his expectation was he wanted to put it in his rec room. Where there's a pool table. And if his friends were over, he wanted to be able to turn that on uh, just as a, curiosity and they'd watch a part of a ball game or something well i found out as i his expectations even for that were probably more than the tv could produce (laughs) because the and some of these older ones i've I've had it before is the longer it ran the picture kept spreading out i mean if if you were at two or three hours this the picture had expanded by 20 or 30 percent and i'd shut it off and i had replaced everything there were no small parts that hadn't been done and I finally found a, another set I could take the flyback out of, put it in there. The same thing happened. Third flyback, same thing happened. So either I, I could only find used bad flybacks, or it was just that there weren't that many hours of television that it wasn't that bad of a design problem that they let it go that way. So I finally had to lower his expectations a little bit, and I got my uh, Western Electric amplifier out of it. <laughs> I got, I got another question for about expectations that, that that I've seen come up, and I've been I've been taken to task 
on this uh, by uh, by at least one person who I think is on the call tonight. Um, but people come out there and they uh, they'll find a cool TV and they might be a, a radio guy or they might just be a person who has maybe a little electrical exper ex experience or maybe no electrical experience, but they express an interest. I mean, they, sometimes they, they want to just find a new line cord and put it on there and they expect the TV is going to work. But but sometimes they say, you know, they might be interested in learning how to do this. And I said, well, you know, it's, I always say it's going to be a it's going to be a pretty steep learning curve. But if you really, really want to do it, uh, you might be able to learn how to do this. Um, and I've been accused of giving bad advice. I don't know uh, what uh, and, and anybody else. Anybody's experience, uh, opinion on that? Yeah, I encounter that all the time. I'm even mentoring a 14-year-old right now who's working on a Zenith Bug Eye. And that's another, just like with TV, when I say, what do you want to do with it? I say, how deep do you want to get into this hobby? Because if you're just going to fix one TV ever, maybe I'll lend you some equipment. Because if you really want to get into it, it's an investment. You know, test pattern generator, a scope, uh, maybe some... Uh, Specialty of sleep alignment generators, a tube tester, or whatever. And dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of reading, which people don't and, do. Anymore. And accumulating all the knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. To, to, to do all, expect me to do all that. We all were there at one point, too, because when we were all novices and uh, the first TV I ever got, I knew very quickly I was in way over my head. And I went back to radios for a while <laughs> until I felt comfortable enough that I gradually work my way back through the TVs. But yeah, I see predictors, predictors are red hot. And all the time people buy one, they've never worked in a TV, maybe even never worked in a radio before, and they're gonna dive in and start working on it. Not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a guy, I think it was just on Facebook today, who uh, wanted to get some advice on these uh, Bumblebee capacitors uh, before he dug into the, uh, into the repair and what he was looking at was two watt resistors and you know, I didn't say anything but I think like maybe you maybe you don't want to be tackling that repair right now. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I try not to give anybody that kind of uh, talking to basically for lack of a better word is like if you don't know anything at all I'm not going to be the one that's going to tell you how to do it. Mentoring a young kid that's with you no problems at all that way. He's under, you know, you're watching what he's doing. He's not going to stick his hand into the into a power transformer, hopefully. But you just tell some guy that calls up and says, hey, how do I fix this and how do I fix that? It's like, I'm not going to get involved in this thing. No way in hell. I don't, I don't care, you know, how much insurance I might have or how much I want to make sure this guy doesn't kill himself. I'm out of this one completely. We have a question in our, in our chat uh, section from uh, Dave B, who I think is online tonight. Um, and he asked, I would like to ask Chuck and the group, once you recap a resistor, et cetera, and get the set operating, what equipment and procedures do you use to align the set? Uh, Chuck, you said you use new test equipment. What do you use and how do you use it? Depends what you're going to be doing with it um if you're just if it's all recapped and you want to you run through a visual check is the quickest thing to do test generator on the uh, on the uh, the unit to look at your your basic you know crosshatch circles anything to do the physical alignment of the picture that usually takes care of 90 percent of a television unless somebody got in there now when i get if you get a set that's really screwed up with, then you're talking, you know, you may need a whole sweep alignment, RF and IF and the sound circuits. And, you know, that's like saying, okay, what equipment do you have? Do you want to use? You know, I have, I think I told you this last one, I have four different sweep setups. I have three spectrum analyzers with tracking generators to do things that, you know, one, one doesn't do as good as the other one does. So, you know, it just depends on what I'm working on. Uh, and it's just all really, and I guess everybody else is going to say the same thing. It comes with experience uh, is what it is. It's, there's no one set piece of equipment that that I've used that does everything I want to do on a television. It just it just doesn't happen. 
And it goes for radios too. I've got some radios that I've had in here that certain pieces of equipment just won't do what I want it to do, especially when you get into, you know, high-end uh, radios with selectivity, IF, selective IFs and the like like that. They're, they're touchy as hell to do those. Setting up some AVC circuits are, are miserable things to set up with if you don't know what you're doing with it. So it's kind of hard even there to tell you, what do I use? Um, basically your eyes are probably your best thing you've got you own to do a television. Yeah, it's tough. It gets back to what I was saying about how deep do you want to get into the hobby because alignment is one of the most common questions I get asked all the time. And I've tried a couple times to demonstrate it and it didn't lead anywhere good because it's so specific to every TV has different alignment instruction. I may very well need different equipment to 22 megahertz IF, 44 megahertz IF, what kind of markers. <laughs> but a, a bigger question might be, does, when do you need to do an alignment? Because quite often you don't. And I, it's the last thing I would recommend anybody even attempt to do <laughs> until you've limited everything else. And that's the cool thing about TVs. One of the things I like about them is this: once the set's working well enough, the screen is a troubleshooting aid. Say, put a test pattern generator up, just look at the screen and adjust your linearity and centering control and whatnot. You don't need, well, ideally, you don't need all this fancy equipment. But obviously, when, <laughs> there it are times easier, when you do. And yeah, then, it, it makes it right. easier in the long run sometimes. And I, I can cut, a, cut, you know, maybe some time off of it. But like you say, the same thing. You put a generator on there. If you're doing not doing color sets, you know, a grayscale generator, sets up brightness and contrast you know the other all the other patterns you put up will give you your linearity controls and anything like that you can even basically you can almost test the crt using just a, a generator going into the thing it'll tell you whether or not you've got enough contrast range on the crt sure so yeah, Bob, focus, you uh, everything you kind of hit on there was a couple of articles the famous art margolis wrote about you know how to how to let your tv tell you what's wrong with it either visually or even through smells things like that but they were very very you know well-written articles for you know people that had a little bit of knowledge around electrical stuff but of course that was also written back in the day when you were popping the back off to pull tubes out of that so <laughs> we're kind of used to poking around in there a little more I uh, recently was going through some old paperwork that I accumulated over the years from eBay and whatnot, and I got a stack of things. It's do-it-yourself. Pop Boys gave them out, the little cards. Some of them were uh, cartoon versions of a TV screen. Does your screen look like this? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? And below was, well, then maybe try swapping this tube out or adjust yep. this control. Yeah, the circular waveform, the circular slide rules back in the day. I think I've got one of those tucked away. Yes, yeah, just wheel it around to what it looks like, and then you read, oh, here's what you need to, here's the tube you need to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Bob, to your point, it's, like you say, it's it's highly set dependent. There's no one-size-fits-all alignment procedure or... You know, Chuck, as you're saying, one size fits all piece of equipment. Um, you know, I look at my Admiral 30A1 and the sound alignment is a long procedure. you got to hook up a VTVM, have the signal generator do all this stuff and peak it and everything. Whereas a Predicta, the shop, the Philco factory manual basically says, keep turning the stuff till you get the loudest volume and then move right. <laughs> and you're done. <laughs> it's very simple. Yeah. Hope we answered uh, lot, this question here. A uh, lo lot of people in a hobby are into the uh, color sets, but um, it, it doesn't seem like there's any, uh, there's an awful lot of newbies that jump in with the uh, color sets. Do any of you guys uh, uh, have people approach you for, uh, for, for the round screen color sets? Any interest in that? Mm -hmm. And if so, what do you do? Only I do more I do anymore, mainly because I, I got right rid of my jig and everything else. So, 
No, I, I've yet to have, have anybody bring me a color set. I've only had a couple people, you know, like I was saying last month, sometimes they'll call the the place I help out at saying, hey, I got this old TV. And um, one time, supposedly a guy had a CT100 that he wanted to get fixed. And I'm like, that's way out of my element. I mean, I tried once to restore a regular CTC5 and could never get it right. So I just said, you know what, I'm just sticking to to black and white that's what i do if i had someone who could you know be side by side with me and mentor me through it i could probably pick it up because people tell me oh it's just a black and white tv with a chroma board <laughs> and a different crt it's not that much difficult well it was for me yeah definitely is a difference and as so i was just saying the fact that i did color sets for a while but you know it's like when you're working on them what do you do with this huge tube Normally, you've got to have a, a, a CRT jig so that you can connect everything up on the bench and, and at least troubleshoot the circuits in it because uh, most of the paper tubes are stuck in the cabinets. You know, I, the last thing I need to do is have a, you know, a 35 inch uh, you know, a console cabinet trying to put that on a bench while I'm working on the chassis. You know, it just doesn't fly here. My bench is big, but it ain't that big. Uh, you, you made my evening, Dan. I have a lot of respect for you, you know, and uh, I've been fixing black and white sets since I was in uh, grade school, and I'm still intimidated by the damn color set. <laughs> yep. I could say at some of the um, conferences when the color sets were being set up in the uh, with the 15 inch sets and all. No two guys that were hovering around it had the same opinion as to what you should tweak first. Hey, Dan, I've got a question for you for your predictors. Sure. On that, on that screen that you've got behind me, that screen is absolutely perfect. How do you clean them? Or most of the ones I find have that white fungus all over it. Will that clean off or is it ruined? Or what do you do for that? It'll clean off. I mean, luckily, sometimes you'll get one that barely blooms, for lack of a better word. I mean, I, I my background is in plastic materials, so that, but, you know, sometimes you'll get one that, I don't think I've ever cleaned this one, and I've had this one about five years. Some people have claim there's a correlation between the amount of green tint in it versus its likelihood to to you know decompose but i don't know if that's really substantiated or not but in short to answer your question um you gotta just scrub that stuff off uh if it's really bad i know people take extremely fine grit sandpaper and sand the whole thing and then use progressively finer and finer grits and then polish it um you know, a headlight restoration kit you can pick up at an auto parts store works very well. You can chuck it in a drill and, you know, that takes some of the elbow grease out of it. But then, you know, eventually it will come back. I've had some sets where they've gone about a year or so before they start looking hazy. I've had others where a week later I can, all, I can run my finger across the screen and already have white residue on my hands. Um, some people have had good luck with car wax. Uh, to kind of seal it. Um, I'm not sure if the decomposition of the material is driven by oxidation or just breaking down, but um, but I love when people always say, yeah, I got this old TV and it smells like vomit. <laughs> well, butyric acid is the byproduct and that's found in the human gut. So yeah, <laughs> it's essentially what you're smelling. As soon as but, they can tell you that, you know, you can tell them the model number, right? Yeah, but you know, I don't know, Bob. You might have some other tips of things you've done because you like to experiment you, with that. Stuff. You summed it up very well. <laughs> I tried putting car wax over one that I polished once, but when I turned the sun on, I could see the wax smeared over. It, so mm. I ended up just cleaning it off. I, I'm you know, there's a lot of different kinds of waxes out there. I've heard rumors that you could clear coat it with polyurethane. I don't have the nerve to try that because I've heard it, but I've never seen it. If it reacts it. with the plastic, well, then that's the end of that. I don't have what, the spares. What product, spare do you, 
what product do you start out with? Like you get one that's got a white face almost, you know, it's really bad. How do you wash I, it off initially? I start out with Scratch X or Novus Number 2, which are both fine plastic polishes. If those don't get the job done, then as Dan said, I might switch to Thousand Grit wet, and wet sand it. Um, once one I got from the Museum of Broadcasting in Chicago, they had kept all their display sets in the basement, which was really humid. And it was really sad because some of the sets were even beyond anything and just rotting away. I got to, to predict the holiday and the screen was the nastiest thing I've ever seen, but I saw it as a challenge. That I took a popsicle stick and just started scraping <laughs> with the edge of the wood because it was that. It was like, I don't know how to describe it really, it was like a waxy buildup. Um, so I scraped it and then I switched to sanding and then I switched to washing. Uh, Did you start out with soap and water or anything like that or Windex I, or something? It's been recommended. I don't see any, none of those have done anything for me. Okay, Julian. They just visit the. Liquid runs off and it has no effect. I think we've got eight predictors on display at the Texas Broadcast Museum and they haze over, but we use a product called Spray 9. And you can get this from mm -hmm. Amazon and you get it from uh, Home Depot and stuff. And it's an amazing cleaner and it'll come back, but it takes off the really cruddy look at least for a while. But you got to come That's back good. and do it every uh, three or four months or else it will uh, start and looking crummy again. But we've tried the headlight polishing and things like that. And, and that that works for a little while, but not for real long. So the Spray 9 is the cheap, quick alternative to make them look OK for a while. And then still, though, after a while, yeah, you can clean the front of it easily, but it also builds up on the back side, and you eventually have to <laughs> take the front of the case apart and clean the back of it, too. Yeah, and that's absolutely no fun whatsoever. No. <laughs> I worked for a Philco dealer back about 1964, 63, 65, and these things came in all the time. And boy, did my bike vocabulary get uh, expanded greatly, helping the boss change picture tubes in these things. Because, I mean, you know, there, it's kind of like taking a watch apart. You can get it apart pretty easy, but putting them back together is no fun at all. So, anyway. Especially when the plastic parts have warped and shrunk and... Nothing lines up. Well, of course they did, you know. <laughs> Hey guys, I, uh, there's a couple of questions I just noticed came in through YouTube. Um, here's a here's a softball for you. But um, uh, uh, Mark Seymour asks, uh, I often get, why do you do it? Why bother? It's old tech. Uh, I say because it's a challenge. How would you guys answer? Some days I ask myself the same question. <laughs> if I'm dealing with a tough dog set, I'm like, is this really worth it? But um, you know, for me, it, it's for personal reasons, being an engineer, I like seeing how technology has progressed. Um, I, I tell people if, if you got something that either runs on gasoline or plugs into a wall, I'm interested in it. Um, yeah, I like seeing, okay, here's this particular piece of equipment. Why did the engineers design it this way? Or what was the state of the art back then? And what was you know, done to further the technology or what was done to cheapen something up or cut corners, um, you know, RCA versus months, so to speak. But I, I like making old things work again. And a lot of the people that I work with to help them restore stuff share that same um, enthusiasm for that. They like, you know, you, you just see this old TV in the corner and you can turn it on. It's something useful. And it was doing what it was originally meant and produced to do. Um, you know, some people think because the analog broadcast went away, oh, well, TVs are useless now. No, it just, it, they just need some minor education on how to make it compatible with the modern world. It will still be done. So. I remember sometimes you find them sitting on the side of a curb and back when I was in the army, I used to sell used TV sets to some of the fellow soldiers and stuff that I'd be driving up in New Jersey down Runson Road and people would toss out a TV set. I had to stop and pick it up because I was more curious as to if it worked or not, 
or what was wrong with it. And surprisingly, many of them hardly had much wrong with them. And I made money that way. But when I see something thrown away for no good reason, other than the fact they don't want it, I, I'm, I'm real curious as to see how far I can go with it. It's just a nature. It's kind of like asking, why do you like a green car? Or why do you like a red car? Or why do you like to see a motor run or something like that? It's just a, a natural uh, thing that I have that I just want to see what's wrong with it and how far can I go with it? Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, I love the challenge. I love solving problems and puzzles. And I have an engineering background like Dan, and I can't, what am I going to do with a modern surface mount board? You don't, you don't fix them. Generally, you just replace the board and a flat screen TV and it works or it doesn't. You're not, nobody's going to, well, very few people would be up for the challenge of actually replacing individual surface mount components. But tube circuits, very creative and interesting engineering goes into them. But also you can get your hands in there, you can work on it. You can actually get to the connections and, and Work them and such. Uh, I find that far more satisfying than modern solid state circuitry. I can uh, throw something in about the satisfaction of being able to fix things, uh, but unfortunately, it goes back uh, getting close to 50 years ago when you'd be carrying your tube caddy into someone's house. Uh, it's the only set in the house, and three kids are lined up on the couch watching you so that you could get it done in time for them to watch their program. And if you do it, you're the hero. And uh, uh, that's, that's still a good feeling that in a lot of cases, I, uh, I still remember. Yeah, I mean, I admit there is a little bit of that too. It's especially because I'm on YouTube. I wouldn't go as far as like showing off, but it is, it is great to be able to share people and go, oh, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> or I'm amazed you were able to get that working again. <laughs> That's nice to get that, you know. Someone uh, on the chat says, uh, that, uh, referring to people as scaremongers, uh, trying to uh, deter yeah. people from wanting to get their hands involved with repairing. Uh, you know, my advice is if it's a old set and you're willing to take a little risk of electrocution, I, you know, I learned by doing it. I mean, I learned the hard way that you didn't take one of those 16 inch uh, glass funnel picture tubes and grab it around the sides because it has high voltage on it. And, uh, and I still twitch every once in a while from some of that stuff. Um, uh, my uh, parents paid a lot of money for me to get a high school class ring. And when they asked, why is it getting all scratched up? It was because several times I stuck my hand where it shouldn't be, threw my hand back and hit the cinder block wall behind me. It was getting my ring all scratched up. So, you, you know, you got to, start out small and uh, start out with something that's maybe um, a, a cheap set and still partially works and see if you can make it a little better and then work your way up from there. Yeah, there's the old saying that there's two types of technicians, those that have been shocked and those that will. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I uh, I find it this personally trying to give it um, guidance or advice to people it's kind of a fine line to walk because on one on one hand you don't want to quash their enthusiasm it's kind of rare that you find someone who's you know got some passion for the same type of hobby or you know maybe a younger person that you know okay this is the future of the hobby here we want to nurture it we don't want to be a jerk and just say oh you don't know what you're doing walk away um but at the same time uh you know what we do like you say, carries inherent risk. And, you know, TVs compound that risk as opposed to a radio. I mean, yeah, radios have B plus that can knock you on your butt and uh, other things. I've, I've had capacitors blow up in my face. I, things happen. But, you know, TV, you've got a huge glass tube that if you do the wrong thing to it, it'll implode. Um, you've got anywhere from 10 to 30 some thousand volts of uh, anode now it's such a low amperage that it likely won't kill you but it's more of your reaction um i had a friend who he was rebuilding an old rca ctc 7 i think something like that but he's going to put the back on and he can't find his quarter inch nut driver and he remembered oh i left it in the cabinet so he reached in and whoever had worked on that television 
they only clip the anode lead halfway into the, the button on the, the bell mm. of the tube, and it picked that moment to fall off and land right on his arm while the set is Ooh. on. And yanking his arm out, he tore a huge gash in his arm on the flyback enclosure and needed stitches. But, uh, yeah, it's... Like I it's say, usually, it's hard because you don't want to throw a wet blanket on it, but at the same time, you want them to proceed with caution. And, you know, unless you can be right there with somebody, I know people try to maybe err on the side of caution because, you know, they don't want to be the one that, oh, geez, I encouraged them to do this and they killed themselves. That's an extreme usually, example, but yeah. It's usually not the shock itself. It's the reflex that you do. And exactly. I remember many years ago, I was in the back of a set with a metal tube in it. And uh, when I reached in with my left hand, I wasn't thinking, and it arced to my left hand. But right behind me, and I was up against the wall, there was a radiator right behind me. And it arced through my hand and went through my back to the radiator. Knocked the crap mm -hmm. out of me. And I'll never forget that. You know, that's dangerous. But still, how many of us have actually not been shocked? And even, you know, just taking the anode loose sometimes. Sometimes it'll zap you, but you get used to it. Try not being, um, try working on pre-war TVs. You only mm. learn one time that 7,000 volts of 60 cycle hurts like hell if you live through it. I blew two holes in my hand because I was stupid one day, reaching in a chassis, not watching where I'm going, blew a hole through one joint and out the fingernail of another. Oof. Physical holes. So, uh, and I was lucky it was only 2,500 volts. And I shudder to think if I had been working on like a TRK-12. <laughs> so uh, you you really got to be careful, you know, compare, compared to that thing there, most CRT 10, 15,000 volters, like you say, the, the damage is done when your hand comes flying out of the chassis, uh, out of the cabinet. But uh, when you're working in the, uh, in that, and that's, you know, again, you're talking six, 60 cycle stuff, and then you say go go do radios. The problem you got to worry about that with newbies on the radios is you got a 110 volt AC in there too, off the power line, like sticking your finger into an electrical outlet. Unless again, they learn. Okay, you need an isolation transformer. You need all this other safety equipment before you go messing around in one of those things. And uh, you know, I I prefer being on the uh, side of uh, caution, telling people, you know, what to do and what not to do if they're not, if they're not sitting here with me. When I was yeah. a young man, we had a furnace repairman that came over to our house and our, we had a fuse box, not a breaker box, but a fuse box on the back porch. And anyway, he suspected we had a bad fuse in there that was open. So what did he do? He licked his two fingers and went across <laughs> each fuse in there. And when he got shocked, that was the bad fuse. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And it just, it didn't bother him. That was his way of looking for a bad uh, screw in fuse and all that I'm thinking. And he's standing on a concrete floor, you know. I've heard stories of my great grandfather doing the same thing. If he was working on a lamp and changed the bulb that didn't fix it, he just lick his finger and stick it in there. And oh, well, okay, that's the that's not the problem. Yeah. But I think the worst was he, he had an old Model T and he got home and it wouldn't shut off. And he just calmly opened the hood, rolled up his sleeve, and laid his arm across all four spark plug terminals. That must have hurt like hell, but he, he didn't seem to care. <laughs> Well, you notice some of us have curly hair, too, you know. <laughs> I think there was a, a cartoon in a technician's publication that shows a guy getting zapped by a radio and his hair is all squiggly. And one of the guys says, oh, that's an AC waveform. <laughs> hey, guys, um, i got to sign off. I want to thank you all for your uh, participation. Keep going with it. Um, I think it's great. So we'll see you next month, if not sooner. Thank you, Steve. See ya. Thank you, Steve. Yeah.
is kind of a, a war story discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to do? I mean, well, so say you have to err on the side of caution if we're on social media or whatnot, and we're giving advice out to people. You have to. Realistically speaking, is it going to burn your house down? Probably not. Is it going to explode? Probably not. But with you can't chance. just say, uh, plug it in and leave the room. Yeah. But you do, Bob, you, you probably see some of the same pushback that I see uh, on Facebook. And, you know, again, face it, all of the newbies are, are out there on Facebook. Uh, people get, uh, you know, they'll ask for some advice and there'll always be one old curmudgeon or, or two or more who will come in and say, if you don't know what you're doing, you got no right to be in there. Uh, and and they'll come back and they'll they'll push back rightfully so I think because they make me think of myself when I was younger they say I, I came here to ask questions I'm, I came here to learn you know I'm not going to learn if you keep telling me just to to go away and don't do it you know so where do you draw that line you know that's a tough call that's tough because when I got into the hobby I didn't have an Elmer and I just I got shocked I just <laughs> I just did it so for me to tell other people not to do what I did mm. it's <laughs> But also times have changed. I mean, you know, we grew up without safety helmets and parents chain smoked in the cars with the windows rolled up and all the rest of it. So, Right. But yeah, I mean, I can think of two dozen instances where I have no right to be alive today. And right. you know, you'd hope, hope not to put somebody else in that position, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. But they do make a point and they, uh, you know, they, they do want to learn. They just, uh, I think that, you know, again, they, I just don't think they want to put in the, uh, uh, in, in the effort, the you know the uh, the practicing and the and the, uh, the and the and the reading, the studying, uh, they they I see a lot of people want to you know they ask a question and they want you to answer that question for them and that helps them get their TV working again and it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, I no, a- that's that's a horrible reality too. Is people post just out of the, they just drop it out of out of out of nowhere and say. Uh, I can't get the horizontal hold to work on my TV. What's wrong? <laughs> you know, a lot more background info than that. Yeah, I don't even try to diagnose a set unless I can be there and put my hands on it and take measurements, from whatever, because it's just it's just too nebulous trying to figure out, you know, they're trying to describe to you what the set's doing or, you know, I've had people FaceTime me and say, oh, here's what I'm getting. You know, what do I, what do I adjust or what do I do to fix this? It's like, well, <laughs> there's numerous things that it could be. And if you don't have the the equipment or that to do the appropriate troubleshooting, it's it's a fruitless exercise. And experience. Yeah. The one that I really love the most is the ones, this is getting off the subject of TVs, but the ones that send you a sound clip and ask you what's wrong with the audio and Mm. i'm sitting here thinking you're sending an audio piece through the internet into my computer with a 20 dollars sound card and five dollar speakers and you want me to tell you why it doesn't sound good (laughs) sounds good to me (laughs) yeah that's basically what i'm saying too it's just hey it's okay over on this side but i know it doesn't sound good on your $10,000 $10,000 audio system, but I can't help you with that. <laughs> when I was selling used TV sets at the flea market years ago, I had some customer come in and he was talking about his wife's ears were real sensitive. And the set that I was trying to sell him didn't have a tone control on it. And I said, well, it's got a flat sound to it. It's a, you know, just a flat sound. I said, it'll sound great. Oh, but my wife, she has sensitive ears and all of that. Has to have just a perfect sound to it. I'm thinking, I have never heard of such a thing. Oh, yeah. They're, well, they're since, out there. Let me, t- let me tell you. Yeah, they're well, out there and they breathe. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there's guys that will send you a, an MP3 file made off of their iPhone. Uh, <laughs> that, that listen to how great my new stereo sounds. It's like, well, <laughs> that's really special. But uh, you know, it sounds like it's coming out of a quarter inch diameter loudspeaker on my end. Well, since you're talking about repairing TVs, I want to give you a story from my uh, working on my master's degree. Uh, I went to Drexel University, which requires hands-on training. 
I had a professor who had done his undergraduate work at Drexel, but went to Princeton to get his doctorate. And he said, and Drexel was hands on, but Princeton's all theoretical type electrical engineering. And he said, I made all my money by fixing the TVs for the, all the other electrical engineers, because along with all the theoretical training, they never taught them that pitch tubes get warm. <laughs> and he just opened the back and set and looked for the one that's not glowing or the cold tube, replace it and ask and say, is that 75 bucks? And he'd get the money every single time. <laughs> I had a guy come into the store I, when I was in high school. I worked at a store called Music Land. Some guy comes in and I said, well, what are you looking for? He says, I want a TV with a 25,000 watt chassis in it. I said, oh, you mean 25,000 volts? No, I want a 25,000 watt uh, television. And I, the guy, how do you argue with somebody? You just say, OK, well, we don't have one. But, you know, I just think. And he thought he was an expert, you know, just like some customers act. <laughs> I wonder what a 25,000 watt TV set would look like anyway. One hell of an electric bill, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, one thing I wanted to touch on, if I may, time. if we could circle back to kind of what we briefly started on talking about, about what sets are worth collecting or restorable. I just wanted to throw out there that if it's got a round picture tube, it's probably worth saving uh, you know, within reason. Uh, also, if it's something you really, really like the looks of and you can afford it, it's hard to go wrong. Uh, and as far as where to find sets, anywhere and everywhere, Craigslist, garage sales, the best place to go, of course, is the annual convention at the TV museum. You get the best deals there and you're gonna see the widest selection. Uh, and finally, ask around. I know a lot of folks are crazy about Facebook for a variety of reasons, but there are a number of collector groups in um, the marketplace. Uh, getting to know other collectors and asking them for leads is a great way to do it, too. I'm finding that many people are uh, looking at some of those old box TV sets and uh, some people want to make, you know, cat beds out of them and stuff right. like that. And it always seems like they take the most valuable sets. Uh, there was somebody on Craigslist that had a CTC4 uh, set there, and they had gutted it and turned it into a cat bed. And I tried contacting the guy, and I said, what did you do with the insides to it? I think he said he still had them. And I said, well, I'm interested in buying what you took out of it. And then he asked me, well, how much do you pay for it? And he never would return any of my emails or anything. But they always seem to take the most valuable sets and turn them into something useless, you know, make it instantly worthless. And But I think some of the millennials are now discovering some of those old mid-50s box sets now. Even ugly ones are taking a liking to it. And I kind of like to see that. I mean, somebody's got to like these things because when I see them, I don't want them, you know, they're, I mean, they're a dime a dozen, but when you find the younger people that we like to see come into the hobby, you know, and they're liking these old box sets, I say, you know, more power to them. And uh, they're, well, it's just like a car dealer once told me, he said, there's a butt for every seat. <laughs> I love watching, you know, you talk about the cat bed people, the, it's pretty much hypocrisy of some collector groups where, you know, like, again, I bring up the mid-century crowd, but, you know, oh, hey, I found this cool marketplace link for a 50s TV that got turned into a cat bed. Oh, that's so cool and that. And then someone has a Drexel end table that somebody chalk painted and they howl bloody murder, you know, get the pitchforks. Let's find this guy and do him in. It's like, well, it's the same thing for us. So. I think the worst things that I've ever seen is where they put a fish bowl in it. There's an antique store here in Knoxville that they had one of like a 57 model RCA console, you know, it stands up off the floor and they turned it into a fish tank. Every time I go in there, you could see what the water was doing to it. Uh, I mean, 
it looked worse. And every week I go and it looked worse and it looked worse and it looked worse. But, you know, it's just it, it, it puts a finite life to it that it destroys the set. And another time I was at a uh, in a state sale and they had this old uh, uh, cabinet radio and they were talking about gutting it and turning it into a bar or a bookcase or something. They should they do it. And I always say, well, what you've got now is worth 50 to 75 dollars. And if it was shopped out working, it'd be worth maybe 150. But if you turn it into a bookcase or whatever, I said, you're going to make it instantly worthless that nobody wants it. And if you like it, that's fine. But then when you're through with it, it'll end up in the dumpster. So when they convert it to something other than its original purpose, it, uh, it puts a finite life on it. And that's the end of that set. Well, uh, I'd, I'd take a little issue with that, Julian, sometimes. I mean, uh, yes, that's that's often the case, but you see people uh, selling uh, selling artistically reimagined things, and they'll take a radio or a TV, and they'll do something stupid to it and put a stupid price tag on it, and they'll get it sometimes, and they'll get something, they'll get a price for it that's several times more than what a a radio or a TV collector will pay for it. So what are you going to do? That's uh, that's our sainted capitalism at work right there. Well, that's called repurposing it, you know, as per the what I call the nose pickers, the collectors, you know. And uh, but anyway, it, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's some sets that are not worth much of anything. I don't mind that. But mm -hmm. it just seems that they always pick the nicest sets that are most valuable to repurpose mm -hmm. sometimes. Well, here, here's, a, here's a question. Uh, I mean, to our panel or, or really to anybody that has an opinion that, to jump in, um, how much longer are we going to be able to, uh, to have the, the hobby continue in the, in the native form that it has been? We're already at the point where people don't believe you can watch over the air uh, television on their, uh, on their TV for free. And if you do, it's more complicated than most people can or are willing to set up now. Um, and, you know, people don't necessarily want to take a VCR, which are also becoming hard to find, to feed a signal into a TV. Um, so we may be getting to the point where, it, it, I mean, forget about getting the TV restored. It's just going to be difficult to use. Um, I don't know. So I'll just toss that hand grenade out there. Any thoughts? That's a real good question. At least for now, you can pretty readily get an HDMI to NTSC converter. If there becomes a point where you can't get those, that will be a problem. <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure why they exist, but they seem to be pretty plentiful on uh, Amazon and other places. Uh, there must be some kind of chip set out there that does it pretty readily, but what, ATSC 3.0 is on the horizon? Uh, I'm pretty sure there weren't any boxes that go from that standard directly to NTSC. So things are going to get harder and harder, I predict, in the future. Where, yeah, where people are going to want to try to keep old VCRs or DVD players with NTSC output running. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're in a good position, so to speak, that all this stuff still works now. And... We probably have all stockpiled equipment so we can keep our collections running. <laughs> what, 30, 40, 50 years from now? I don't know. I don't know. But well, I'll understand. throw another good one at you there. Uh, a while back, I was in a discussion. You know, we're talking about our cars, you know, antique cars like a 55 Chevy or just, you know, any old car. Um, now they're trying to get cars to go electric now and they're talking about by 2035 they want some manufacturers to make nothing but electric cars what happens if we run out of uh, gasoline or something like that where it becomes scarce and they uh, mm -hmm. that the arabs can't pump any more oil out well that's one side of the fence but the other side of it is what do you think just take for example like a 55 chevrolet just say 50 or 75 years from now what what's going to happen to it when you either can't drive it or you can't afford the gasoline or or something and the cars will exist then but will they be just strictly static displays for museums or will people just have them or you know what will happen to cars you know like 50 or 100 years from now long after we're gone 
you know, I've thought about that. And I would say the same thought could apply to television sets as well. Yeah, there was a question that just went by about uh, rebuilding picture tubes. That's another huge <laughs> uh, issue you know, looming in the future as well. The picture tubes, one by one by one, all go dead. And until somebody can rebuild them, that's, that's going to be a showstopper. Yeah, I was going to, you know, build on what you were saying earlier, Bob. It's, you know... Yeah, having a broadcast signal or the equipment to make the TV work, but you know, parts are going to dry up. Um, I mean, I'll admit when I was much younger and the first time I saw what would eventually become the first TV I'd restore, uh, my thinking was, oh, I got to put modern guts on this because there's no way you're going to be able to find parts for something this old. But uh, I'm glad I had many more years between that thought and when I actually got my hands on the TV to know that, no, you, a lot of the discrete parts are still there, but, but, you know, looking through DigiKey, trying to order parts and that, you know, like the axial leaded capacitors and things like that, there's more marked as, you know, they're going to be obsolete. You can't get them anymore. And yeah, there's ways around it, but, uh, you know, finite things like picture tubes, you know the big one once those are gone as of now they're gone then what happens but i mean this is heading off into philosophical discussion territory <laughs> but oh yeah so no i mean if they stop making high voltage film capacitors or 450 volt electrolytics we're going to be in trouble <laughs> yeah Now you've almost kind of ruined my evening thinking about that now. <laughs> well, that's why we got to keep buying them so that they keep making. Them. <laughs> Some of them just naturally deteriorate when they're in storage, you know, electrolytics uh, and stuff. And unfortunately, just to ask a question to anybody out there. <clears throat> Has anybody ever tried to restore an um, RCA CTC? Um, 81 or uh, 74 chassis. That's a solid state chassis, one of the early RCA solid state uh, sets. I hate those things. Usually, oh. if you have a flyback, though, you're done because there's just not much of a replacement. Now, some years ago, Magnavox was here in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're based, they had their world headquarters here. And we had a lot of good engineers there. And I remember they had this Chinese guy that they imported from China, and he was their flyback engineer. And of all the crazy things, when I was selling used TV sets at the flea market, he was set up at the flea market selling Chinese goods and stuff like that. But he was the flyback man. Well, some years back, I, I'm in the arcade business, and I have uh, video games, but I remember an, an Atari video game. Uh, had three 25 inch monitors in it. And it was, in a, you know, you're sitting down, it looked like a console thing. Each one of those monitors was an amplifone uh, monitor. It had just a board in there. It had this real weird flyback on it, but they were very susceptible mm. to the flybacks going bad. Well, I had one of those, I had a monitor dead and I thought what to do. So I got, I forgot his name, Mr. Wong or something like that. And he looked at it and I showed him the diagram. And he says, I think I can help you. So he went, when he went back to work, he opened up his file cabinet and he had a file cabinet full of flybacks. He pulled up a Magnavox flyback, held it up in the air and says, yep, this will work. And he re-engineered it and redrew my diagram there. And he engineered a, a Magnavox flyback into it. And it not only worked, but it worked well. And anyway, I, I got rid of the unit there as a working unit, but some of those things can be done. But that 81, they had that strange in, in, uh, cap, encapsulated flyback there. I imagine you could re-engineer another flyback into it if you know the parameters of it. It shouldn't be that hard. You can get it to match up to the yoke, but you know it makes it work a little while longer. But it's going to be a while before those 81s become really collector's items, I would think. Yeah, but it, it happens. <clears throat> um, 
the big problem with the set is, uh, or the sets that I have come into contact with, yeah, of course they're modular sets, and you know all the modules. Th th those are pretty reliable, pretty good. Uh, generally, uh, not much of a problem there. The big problem, of course, they used an ITR circuit for the horizontal deflection and high voltage, and those ITRs, of uh, course, uh, they didn't they didn't have any good linear uh, uh, flyback type of systems at that time. They had to use switching transistors to do it, ITRs. And uh, the big problem there is that you can't get the damned ITRs. They no longer make them. And so that's what you're going to run into in solid state devices is the, the pro, it, it, you cannot find replacement parts, uh, particularly uh, switching devices like that. It was a part specifically engineered for that set, and it's no longer in production. And I've yeah. got a lot of new old stock RCA parts, and I might have some of those transistors. I've been buying up, you know, people that went out of business. But yeah, there's a lot of integrated circuits now, no longer available because it's an obsolete part, and uh, they uh, and the sets are not yeah. that many out there to demand a, a replacement. Yeah, the ITR are that's the tough one, uh, and and they're not the same. I mean, they they, they use a they use two ITRs that are uh, switching devices that toggle back and forth kind of things. And uh, uh, the specs on one are different from the specs on the other. And of course, they're not interchangeable. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, and it's too bad. And that's what, that's what everybody's going to run into as they start to restore the newer types of sets uh, is that, the, the active devices are just not going to be available. And, and it's, it's too bad because like the, the couple of sets I got, everything else is beautiful. <laughs> everything else works fine. Except and another another problem is uh, people now, when they clean out shops and stuff like that, they see all these uh, transistors, you know, like the RCA SKs and the ECGs and all of that. I see a lot of them where they're just throwing them away now because they, they don't know what they've got and they're disappearing that way. But if you can find some new old stock, that's about our only hope there. But getting them to re-engineer a, a, a chip there is going to be kind of difficult. If you happen to, to run into any ITRs or SCRs, depending on how you look at it, in your in your stock there, I would sure like to know. Send me a part number if you can. If I can see it, an ECG equivalent or an SK or something, or the uh, RCA I'll part send number. You a, I'll send you an RCA part number. How's that? Might be, I might be able to help you because I've got a whole bunch of boxes full of new old stock stuff. Of um, There wow. is one I got a large SK and an ECG collection there. And, I don't know exactly what I've got because I just don't use many of those parts anymore and I just don't go rummaging. But if I have a part number or an ECG or an SK, I can always look. Okay. Uh, to whom am I talking? I'm Julian Burke. My email address is real easy. It's Julian Burke 51. That's J U L I A N B U R K E. And then the number 51. And that's at gmail.com. And just send me some part numbers there. And uh, when I can feel like it, or if it's not too cold in my building, something like that, I can rummage through those boxes. I might be able to help you because I do have quite a collection of uh, NOS uh, RCA stuff, those little small oh, RCA boxes. Okay, so it's uh, Julian Berg, J U L J U L I A N B U R K E 51 mm -hmm. at gmail.com. That's correct. And I also have some kits that RCA made. Uh, they were, you know, one of those looks like a fishing tackle box, with little compartments in it. Yep. They made these things for specific chassis. And if I remember yes. correctly, there was one for an 81, an 82, or it'll say this is also yes. for something like that. I've got a half a dozen of those, and some of them may have a part or two missing, but I know where those are, and I found them the other day, but... I have some of those and I'll look and see what I've got because 
uh, and let, I like round tube sets, you know, and I, I only want to go up to like 1965 mm -hmm. or, or some of the early XL 100s I like. But when mm -hmm. we get up in those CTC 81s and all of that, I just don't have much interest in them and I don't have room for them and they don't tell the story that I'm trying to tell anyway, but I might be able to help you there. Thank you, Julian. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you an email. My pleasure. Thank you. This illustrates a good point when I, because I also often get asked, well, where, where do you find parts? Where can you get parts? And I often tell them, join clubs, join, <laughs> join this online community because we're the guys that have stuff. Because we've been working with the stuff for a long time and we've got parts, chassis and bins full of parts and whatnot. Uh, rather oh. than just uh, going onto eBay and trying to find something. Hey, Dan, I've got a new old stock yoke for a predict. I think it's for the 17er. Do you ever have many, much problem with yokes in those things, or is it just flybacks only? I've only come across one bad yoke. It was in a 21-inch set. Um, you know, flybacks, typically, I, I found to be reliable, but I don't know if they maybe had a, a bad run of them. Um I was working on a set for a guy and go through it, do the first power up. I noticed the picture looks a little trapezoidal and smoke is coming out of the flyback box. The there's that resistor that's across the yoke socket that had burned up. And there was one portion of a winding that had gone open. So all the current was going through the resistor instead of half of it. So I found another flyback and a part set I had. I put that in, same thing happened. I put the meter on the yoke socket, that same end of the winding opened. I called a friend that I had sold a used flyback to for what he thought, you know, he was going to have a project and he wanted to have that as a backup. Well, he didn't need it. And I said, well, I'll buy it back from you because I need it. He sent it to me. I didn't even put it in the set. I just put the meter on that terminal and that one was open. I mean, three in a row, what are the chances of that happening? But I got lucky. I, you know, I'm in the other hobbies and I'm at a swap meet for antique outboard motors of all things. But uh, somebody introduced me to the guy who was running the shop and says, hey, Dan works on old TVs and that. And turns out he collected predictors and he had a whole bunch of them and he sold off some, but he still had a few, but he had a lot of old parts. And I said, you know, I'm looking for a flyback. Here's the Philco number and here's the, you know, the Thorderson numbers and that. And he said, well, let me go home and look. And he calls me the next day. He says, yeah, I've got a flyback for you. Um, you know, we, we threw a price at me, which I thought was more than reasonable. And I said, I'll be right over to get it. And that finished the, the project. But yeah, sometimes it can be quite a challenge. Now, let's see, what was that outfit? Were they up in Minnesota that made those uh, uh, new predictors with a color tube? What was their name? What did they call oh, them? Yeah. I have one, but I think they use like an RCA CTC 81 or something along that line. Have you had they any did. experience with those? Because I've got one that's also DOA. and I need to get into that thing one of these days. I've never... I've never seen one in person. I know there's guys in like the Facebook groups that, that own them. Um, I've read somewhere that some of those sets use the RCA color track chassis, but they weren't limited to that. Um, aside from that, I don't really have much info on them, unfortunately. They never but, gave a, a, a diagram with them, I don't think, but I've got one there. It's a nice looking set and it's a, like they're the collector's items now, but I just wondered, uh, you know, if anybody's had much experience with those. No, I've never seen one in person either. But I do know that they 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 can sell for more than a real predictor these days. <laughs> yeah, Telstar, that's the name of the outfit. I had they stopped making those because they couldn't find any more RCA color track chassis or whatever they were using. Their, their supply dried up, so they couldn't source any more color picture tubes or, or chassis to use. There was one of those part sources uh, up north somewhere that they supplied, you know, parts for the TV repairmen. Somehow or the other, they were selling complete RCA chassis, 
you know, I can't remember which one, but, you know, like an 81 or something like that. And they were selling them. They didn't guarantee them to work. They just said that their parts for uh, what they call it for uh, picking parts, uh, part source only, you know, and I just wonder if they got a whole bunch of them like that or if RCA had a run of those things they got rid of. But, you know, now they're gone, you know, and finding parts. And like he said, that ITR transistor, you know, that's going to be a problem you know, with those sets. Knock on wood, uh, I gotta say, I have found maybe only one bad flyback ever. And I work mostly on 40s, 50s, black and white sets. Obviously there were companies that made replacements, Ram, Thord, Arson, whoever. So obviously they did go bad. I'm thinking is that if you were people who were watching TV five, six, seven hours a day, every day, I would imagine the flybacks had a far higher rate of failure than if you watch it an hour a month. <laughs> so, and I'm also thinking the early sets were probably retired earlier because screen size had increased so rapidly. Um, but maybe these 10 inch 1947, 48, 49 black and white TVs don't have a lot of hours on them. Maybe that's why the flybacks are generally good. I don't know. I know the predictive flybacks generally look like hell because the wax cracks on them. Everybody thinks, oh, they're bad. No, they're not. Just paint some Corona dope on them. And they just look terrible. <laughs> I had one of those predict rocket ships, I guess, you know, that Danish modern. Oh. I had that thing for years, and I had a guy that more or less bamboozled me out of it. And anyway, apparently he restored it and got it working and you know stuff like that but now it seems like he's interested in that telstar that i've got and i said well i'll trade you back even with it i'd gladly trade him that telstar for that uh, danish modern to get it back because i remember i found that at a flea market down in uh, florida and we had a, a mercedes benz back then we had the kids that would sleep in the back seat you know they were just little uh, children back then but that uh, tell, uh, that uh, rocket ship set it fit perfectly down in the floor face down in it you could put a blanket over it that's how we got it back and all that and I had that thing for 30 years and this guy's a predictor nut and he had to have it and I sold it to him what I thought was a good price but now I kind of like to have it back and getting that Telstar because you know thinking about that RCA chassis I just never liked working on those chassis A Danish modern, the Continental predicted those are in really high demand. <laughs> they seem to keep cropping up out of the woodwork, though. There's one big auction in Texas right now. Somebody else just posted they found one recently, so they're out there. But they still, they command. There's <laughs> one on an auction site right now, and the opening bid on it, I think, is $1,600 right now, wow. currently, this week. Yeah, I can believe it. I got one sitting in my shop right now. <laughs> and the my price on is? The way. Hmm? And the price is? You'd have to ask the owner. And I don't think he wants to sell it. <laughs> they never do. I'm just the repairman. I went like, to an estate sale here in Sequoia Hills one time. They had three predictors in this estate sale, but every one of them had an NFS uh, tag on it, not for sale. I don't know why they didn't pull it out if they wanted to keep it, you know, but man, it just made me mad because they had one of those uh, Danish moderns there. And, but, you know, I guess they were teasing us. Huh. I think I do have some uh, Thordeson flybacks for a predicta. I've been kind of finding those occasionally over the years. I've never had to use one. And I do have that yoke for, I think it's for the 17 or I'm not sure, but that's, I think that's what says on the box there or something there, but I got a few goodies there, but, and I do have a parts predictor. In fact, I think I have two of them there. I've got some picture tubes there that 21 inch. So I'm just trying to save those for what I might need, but. Anyway, I've got one predict that's got that nasty face on it there. It's all white. And uh, I got, I like the idea 
of uh, you know using a popsicle stick there and scraping that stuff off. You know, you can use that wood and not damage the plastic there. That's exactly why. <laughs> I'll I mean, so, so all this predicted talk, it is remarkable for a set that was supposedly a flop that ruined Philco. Boy, they made a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. You, uh, I, Julian, where are you located? I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, okay. I'm I'm near Indianapolis. I have, uh, I think most of you already know, I have two Philco predictors, new in the box, never opened. I've got the 17er and I've got that 21, the G4242. <clears throat> but in that uh, uh, 21 inch set, what I did do, I cut a little square hole down in the bottom corner of the box that I can peek up inside that and take a look at it. And yep, it's in there all right. And I see the tags hanging on it, I think. But one thing, they use that foam, you know, that real thin, like quarter inch foam they put on top of it to predict it. I think that stuff's gone south in there and it's kind of sort of melted into, or, you know, it's kind of, it's sticky and all of that. That's the only thing that bothers me. And I thought one of these days, maybe up there at the television uh, museum, maybe I can bring one up there and we'll have an opening of one of those and open up a brand new and let everybody see what a new predictor look like coming out of the box. I bet none of you have seen one of those. <laughs> Do I have any feedback on that? Would someone like to see something like that? I would Absolutely. love to see that. Yes. When Phillips was here as Magnavox, they were talking about, they had sort of a museum, and they were talking about buying those uh, predictors from me, or at least one of them. And um, because, you know, Philco and Sylvania and Magnavox and Phillips, they're all the same thing. And they were talking about it, but thank goodness I never sold them one. But anyway, I've got those two. I found those up in uh, uh, northern, going up to Missouri. There was a guy that his dad was in the TV business, and he worked out of his hip pocket. But when he had taken trade-in sets, he was putting them in front of some of his new stock. He also had one of those predictive princesses, that console that swiveled. I think that's what it was. He had one of those that was new in the box, but at that time it never interested me. And he did have one of those barber poles, I think, that was in the box. And for some reason, I didn't see fit to buy that one like I should have. But I did want the ones that are in the box and they're sealed. They've never been opened. <laughs> yeah, if you were around me right now. Show I'm sort off. of in the predictor room right now. I need a few more in there. <laughs> yeah, Bob, you make me nervous every time you lean back in that rocking chair. I'm worried you're going to smack that screen. Uh, I, I checked before we started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to uh, share a, uh, a picture here for a second. And because I'm on my damn iPad, it probably won't work. Let's see how that works. Uh, there we go. Yep, it did share. James Hawes, are you still there? James, I think I saw your picture on the screen a yes. minute ago. Still here. Hi. Yeah, we were talking a few months ago. Uh, I found this photo. This is that uh, video standards converter that uh, I took the picture of up at the uh, AWA Museum. It was you I was talking to about this, wasn't it? This is a, I thought it was an optical standards converter, but it's actually an acoustic standards converter. And it, it feeds in, there's a transducer, and it feeds the uh, a video signal in to some sort of a glass or, or some sort of a disc, and it bounces around in there, and it picks, it's picked up with another transducer on the other end, and I have no idea how it works, and it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen, but uh, I took this picture probably in like 1989, and I just found it again the other day. You're sure it's not just a big delay line? Nope. Um, it, it's, here, let me see if I can find the, uh, now, hang on, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to stop this share for a second. I'm going to go back. It's going to take me a minute, so I'll probably bore everybody to tears while I'm uh, 
trying to find the other picture, but I actually, uh, um, I, I zoomed in and enhanced that uh, label and you can almost read it. So let me, uh, let me see if I can uh, find that picture I had. And uh, that's probably going to take me longer than uh, anybody's going to want to wait. What standards but, does it know, compare? Here it is. I believe it was between PAL and NTSC. Wow. But let me take, let me bring up the, let me bring this sheet up. Uh, uh, yeah, hang on. I got, I found it. Hang on just a second. I can, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, boy, it's amazing that we can do this stuff, but it still isn't easy. Uh, create link. Got it. Copy the link. And come back to the link. Let's see. Uh, share contents, website URL, and paste it in there. Here comes another one. And uh, so this is the label on it, and it's uh, it's not quite easily readable, but it's uh, during the 1960s, the requirement was for conversion of the 525 line signals from videotapes or satellites to 625 line European standard and vice versa. Since the 525 line standard was based on 60 fields per second, as opposed to the European 50 fields per second, field rate conversion was needed as well as line rate. Accordingly, uh, the BBC developed standards converters incorporating necessary field storage. The object on display is an acoustic delay line giving field storage whereby components of the 525 line signal could be omitted or interpolated to give a satisfactory 625 line output. Um, and then it gets kind of hard to read. Anyway, um, that's just the, this is just the, the wackiest thing that I'd ever seen uh, as far as a video. Uh, a piece of video equipment. And I was really happy that I was able to find, it was an old uh, four by five print that I found laying in a drawer from a hundred years ago. That's fascinating, Dave, thank you. That, that is, is wild. I have no idea how it works, but uh, it, it, it must bounce around in there and, uh, and, and you know, go, music goes around and around and it comes out here. Yeah, that's- anyway. The second part is much more complicated. How they how they're interpolating and changing things around. I could understand the delay. I mean, they certainly did that with mm. the Apollo signals, yep. uh, with original black and white ones. But yeah, I didn't yep. know exactly how they did this in the uh, European mm. Union. Well, I don't know either, but it was certainly uh, uh, weirdly fascinating. So anyway, I just, like I say, I, I was looking for that, and I I don't I didn't ever expect to find it, but I did. So. There it was. <laughs> Thank you. That's, uh, uh, that second paragraph says it's a big piece of quartz. So it's actually, uh, uh, it's an acoustic you know, piezoelectric uh, delay line. Um, and it, I think it also said it, it's a, a full field. Uh, by the time it goes around and hits all those flat facets and gets to the output. Mm. Um, what it reminds me of is um, the project we had uh, at Motorola and uh, CBS Labs with a, a video player that uh, used microfilm um, in order to um, have a, a micro, microfilm image that you could play back without uh, paying attention to field number one or field number two, what they would do is they used a uh, video delay line so that they could put both fields of a frame on, uh, on a frame of microfilm and then 
repeat that next frame. So each, each frame was a complete frame, but was only used for a 60th of a second for the playback. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the uh, player didn't have to line up with the line structure of one field or, or the other. But the uh, original uh, equipment that they used for uh, the delay was acoustic delay lines using mercury instead mm. of quartz. And uh, so they, they had a, a field's worth of delay. I don't know what the... Uh, Speed of sound is through mercury, but I, I know it's a lot faster than through air, so it must have taken a lot of mercury. Well, I remember they used to use mercury as a form of memory in the early uh, computers, but well, Wayne, explain something to me, because as I always preface this with, uh, I am not an engineer. I am the furthest thing from an engineer, um, and I just don't understand how they can push a video signal through an acoustic transducer, that would just seem to me to be something that would, would have been a bad idea. Yeah, um, I, I can't tell you if it was a baseband signal or if um, maybe more likely it was modulated on a carrier so they didn't um, have um, concern about dispersion of, of the uh, video frequencies and, and smearing, just like with videotape, the, the luminous signal is put on an FM carrier because that reduces the fractional bandwidth instead of going mm. from you know 30 hertz to four megahertz, you now go from uh, three megahertz to six megahertz, which is only a two to one ratio, just to pick numbers out of the air. Mm. Well, in, in my ignorance, that just seems like a lot of frequency response to ask from an acoustic device. Um, well, when you think about it, a crystal oscillator can run at tens mm -hmm. of megahertz. So, uh, mm -hmm. the mechanical uh, vibrations can get up there. Mm -hmm. Never thought of that. Yep. How would you use mercury for a memory device in a computer? It just seems like being sort of a liquid form. Where would the uh, information be stored? Well, uh, I'm not the uh, the guy to ask about that, but as I understand it, they had very, very long tubes full of mercury, and they'd push a signal in a bit, if you will, into one end, and it would come out the other end uh, at, at some noticeable delay later, it was a delay line, and then they'd feed it back again, and they, you know, or into another one, and they could just keep it going pretty much forever that way. Um, that's, that's an ignoramus's explanation of mercury storage in a computer, but uh, I heard somebody much smarter explain it. That's my uh, distorted uh, interpretation. The fact that it took, that it came out a little bit later than it went in meant they could always recapture it and just keep it in circulation. Well, you're talking about wave, waves that go across something that's uh, partly liquid. And they've done that a lot with uh, video devices over the years. The Ida 4, for example, the Scofany uh, uh, television that they use, it was a mechanical television that they used in England. And uh, it was capable of, uh, of making real black and white pictures, not green and white, and larger screens. Um, and uh, it was mechanical mechanism that went at the British uh, standard, five, 405 lines. So mm. it was actually ahead of the CRT televisions at the time. And that was baseband, as far as I know. So it waves across the liquid. At one time, I used to work at Oak Ridge in the Y-12 plant. And um, they were always real cautious about mercury. 
But back in the World War II, they had to distill mercury uh, for purity there because that was part of some of the one of the components in bomb making for some reason. <clears throat> but I remember I, I went into this one room once before with another guy and he said, see that thermometer up there? And it had a red mark. And he says, if that needle ever comes anywhere close to that red, that red mark up there, you evacuate immediately. But back in the day, they had these buildings and they had this large round thing where they were actually distilling mercury. And the mercury vapor would be in the air and it would settle on switch boxes up there, you know, fuse boxes and stuff at the time. And they had a guy that would go in there, if not on a daily basis, he would go in there fairly often with a paintbrush and he'd be brushing the mercury off of the switch boxes so it wouldn't short out. Now you talk about something, you know, before they knew the dangers of mercury. And there was some other something one time, one of their surplus sales, they had a tank that was full of mercury and somebody bought the tank and they didn't want the mercury and they opened up the valve on the thing just drained it out there on the ground and all of that but the uh, around oak ridge to this day uh going out uh, the oak ridge turnpike and various points they have these wells and they're sampling wells that they go through there because there's still mercury in the ground from world war ii that they have a guy that goes out and he takes samples out of these wells checking to see if there's any mercury content in it and the streams and the rivers that are near Oak Ridge, here if you uh, go fishing out there, they say don't eat the fish because they're mercury contaminated. And uh, to this day, they still have sort of a problem out there, but you never hear about it much anymore, but they keep that a secret. That, that reminds me, uh, that's where the expression mad as a hatter comes from. Too. They used to use uh, mercury when they were preparing the, uh, the, the stiffening, the brims inside the hats, and the mercury uh, vapor would be uh, available for breathing. So these guys would go crazy occasionally. I remember when I lived up in Seattle up there, I made friends with, it was over the Seattle City Light. And he'd save mercury out of these switches that they had up there. And he gave me this quart jar you know, full of mercury one time. And it was kind of fun to take a silver dime at that. And this is early 60s now. Silver coins were still out there. Have you ever taken a, a silver coin or a dime and get mercury to stick to it? Makes it real shiny and slippery and stuff. And there was a, one of my mom's uh, dad's friends. He liked uh, rock collecting and stuff like that. And I remember when we moved away, I gave him that big thing of mercury. Seemed to be really happy about it. But I don't know, mercury's expensive now, but, you know, we used to play with it at kids, with as kids. Well, it's getting a little late, and I've got an early day ahead of me tomorrow, so I guess I might sign off, but it's been a real pleasure here this evening, and I wish everybody a good night there, and it's a pleasure chatting with you, and especially you, Dan. Maybe we could do something with one of those predictors I've got. We could have a grand opening up there of one of those. And, you know, that'd be kind of interesting because sooner or later, they uh, they need to come out of that box and see what they look like, you know. And you get to see a, a brand new predictor that's never never been sold, never been touched, except it still has fingerprints on it from the people at the factory. So that would be an interesting thing to do. I wonder that'd how be quite, we, quite a thing. Yeah wonder how much uh, 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 he would pay me to come up there and open that box up there. You know, it's got to be a money-making thing in here somewhere. <laughs> we, we could raffle off the, uh, the chance for the winner uh, gets to open the box. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. We could do a raffle there, $5 for a chance for you to actually open the box up carefully, and we'll lift that thing right out of the box. and and the fresh air that's in there from the Philco Corporation. <laughs> we'll get a gold-plated box cutter for the occasion. Yeah, Philco <laughs> air. Oh. Not a bad idea. I like that thought. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. Well, let's call it a night, uh, gentlemen. I mean, unless anybody wants to stay on, you're welcome to stay on and uh, and chat. But uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna roll up the sidewalk here. But, I'll be uh, doing the same. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Thank was, you. Uh, I think it, it it went pretty well. And uh, is Bob still here? Thank you, Bob. Still whether here. you're here or not, there you are. Thanks a bunch. This was great. Um, I think we got. Uh, uh, going over your uh, notes, I think we've uh, we've certainly got uh, uh, some fodder for at least one or two more of these too. Uh, there, there's an awful lot that uh, uh, I guess gets talked about a lot, but I think we've got some real, um, uh, you know, opinions here backed up by experience as opposed to your typical uh, Facebook participant. So uh, this is good. Good night, folks. Have a blessed evening, guys. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.